Mike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since this is our first program of the new year, I'd like to bring you a man who has made two important resolutions. The first resolution was to give every member of his cast a raise. The second resolution was to forget the first one. <laughs> and here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, Don, I thought that was a very unfunny introduction. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I happen to think it was very funny. Well, I don't care what you think. You know, you may not know this, Don, but you can get brand new, shiny 1946 announcers without waiting for Detroit to make up its mind. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't mind having a thin announcer for a change. I'm getting pretty sick of looking at a pot that big without flowers in it. <laughs> so just... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Happy New Year, Don. Well, same to you, Mary. Hey, what about me? Aren't you going to thank me for the swell time I showed you New Year's Eve at that nightclub? Yeah, but next time, let's not go home at 11.30. <laughs> now, Mary, you know very well that we didn't get home till daybreak. Boy, was I raring. <laughs> you should have seen him, Don. Jack drank one bottle of Coca-Cola, jumped up on the chandelier, beat his chest, and yelled, Look at me, I'm Tarzan. <laughs> yes, sir. And he fooled everybody if he hadn't opened his shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, how about that Tarzan yell I gave? That wasn't a Tarzan yell. You sat on a hot light bulb. <laughs> Now, Mary. And then he drank another bottle of Coca-Cola without a chaser yet. Well, I can have a little fun, Candy. Anyway, I was the life of the party. You were nothing but a big show-off. I was not a show-off. Then why did you ask the waiter to throw you out? <laughs> I just did that for a gag. Now, Mary, you know very well we had a marvelous dime. We danced all evening. Okay, I had a marvelous time. you darn too. <laughs> Say, Mary, is Jack a good dancer? I don't know. It's the first time I ever did the minuet. <laughs> oh, stop, will you? You've done the minuet before. Yeah, but not while the band was playing Cow Cow Boogie. <laughs> Mary, now, on New Year's Eve, you've got to let yourself go. You Say, know. Jack, what'd you do at the stroke of 12? What did he do? He said, Happy New Year, took an aspirin, and passed out. <laughs> Well, I wasn't out long, sister. <laughs> and, Don, when I came to, I went around and kissed every woman in the place. You did? Yeah. And Mary was so jealous, she tried to stop me. I wasn't jealous. I was only trying to tell you the place was closed and those women were mopping up. <laughs> hmm. I was wondering why they, why they all wore upsweep hairdos. <laughs> Anyway, let's forget about me. How about you, Don? Did you have a good time New Year's Eve? Oh, I sure did, Jack. At the stroke of 12, I crawled out of the fireplace and filled all the stockings with toys. Fill the stockings with toys? On New Year's Eve? Don, you you were seven days late. I know. I was stuck in the chimney. <laughs> See, well, that's terrible. You could have fallen down and hurt yourself. Yes, but I was lucky enough to catch the flu. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm glad you you uh you what? I was in the chimney, but I was lucky enough to catch the flu. <laughs> Don. Uh... Don, I, uh, I have an arrangement with Abbott and Costello. We leave them alone, and they leave us alone. <laughs> so, let's, so let's try it. Well, happy... Hello, Larry. Happy New Year. Same to you, Jack. Did you, Jack? Why, well, Larry, what's come over you? You've always called me Mr. Benny. Well, don't you remember? On New Year's Eve, you said I could stop calling you Mr. Benny and call you Jack. When did I tell you that? Right after your second Coke. <laughs> you mean before the aspirin tablet? Well, Larry, I still like the idea of you calling me Mr. Benny. I mean, it adds a little dignity to the program and shows you have respect for me. Uh, do you want me to call you Mr. Benny, too? No, no, that won't be necessary, Mary. 
Gee, I can call him Jack. <laughs> and now, folks... Wait till the girls with their May Company hear about this. Now, wait a minute. Don't get smart, Miss Livingston. Oh, do call me Mary. Now, cut that off! <laughs> Come on, Larry, let's have your song. Now, Mary, you behave yourself, will you? <laughs> that was a grand night for singing, sung by Larry Stevens. And very good, Larry. By the way, kid, uh, you uh, you made a record of that song, didn't you? Yes, I did. Well, it's a great number. I'd like to have one of those records, Larry. Well, why don't you buy one, Mr. Benny? It only costs 75 cents. <laughs> well, I, I thought about buying one, kid, but you see, uh, I just wanted your song, and the record has something else on the other side, you see, so I... I didn't feel like paying for both sides. Maybe they'll slice it for you. <laughs> no, no, I asked them. <laughs> and you sh- and you should have heard. Hello, Dante. Hi, Olivia, and a good, good evening to you, Mr. Benny. What? <laughs> Mr. Benny, Phil, what's that? One of my New Year's resolutions. Respect for the boss. I made it on New Year's Eve. Well, that's a nice resolution. They told me I made it, and I'm going to keep it. I thought so. Phil, I never saw a guy like you. You keep going to parties, but you never know what happens. You can't even remember if you've had a good time. Jackson, when I get up the next morning, brush my teeth, and the bristles fall out of the toothbrush, I know I had a good time. (laughs) Oh. Hey, look, uh, how about you, Jackson? Did you have fun New Year's Eve? Uh, yes, Phil. I went over to the... Uh, That's qu- all, Jackson. If you can remember, you didn't have fun. <laughs> well, I can remember all of it. And, Phil, as long as you're making resolutions, you could have made another one. During this new year, why don't you learn something about music? You mean I should be like Stokowski? No, Phil. No. All I ask is... All I ask is when you look at your music stand and see a piece of paper that has lines across it and little black dots all over it, don't turn to your boys and say, there's a spy around here. This stuff is in coal. (laughs) Little as they know, it embarrasses them. All right, Jackson, all right. That'll be another one of my resolutions. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a number by Phil Harrison as orchestra who will play it not backwards, not forwards, but in their usual manner. They'll start in the middle and blast both ways. <laughs> All right, Phil, let's... Oh, have... wait a minute, Jack. <laughs> what is it, Mary? I meant to tell you that the way over here, I stopped off at your house, and while I was there, Fred Allen called. Fred Allen, huh? Well, what did the dead end of Allen's Alley have to say? <laughs> I haven't heard such language since Mama stepped on Papa's bare foot with her track shoes on. Well, Mary, Allen didn't have to use that kind of language, even if he was talking about me. It wasn't his fault, Jack. He was reading one of those contest letters. No. Oh, he's just jealous because more people hate me than him. <laughs> That's all. What about the contest, Jack? Have the winners been picked yet? Uh, not yet, Don. The judges are reading the letters as fast as they can. But on Sunday, January 27, three weeks from tonight, we'll announce the winners. Three weeks from tonight. It won't be very long until I'll be paying off the prize. Hey, Jackson, as long as you're paying off, how about that little bet I want from you on the Rose Bowl game? Phil, I didn't see the game, so the bet's off. <laughs> I mean, how, how do I know that USC lost? Huh? Are you kidding? The score was printed in every newspaper in the country. So what? Last Wednesday, I picked up the newspaper on my front lawn and it said no rain today. Paper was so wet, I could hardly read it. <laughs> So don't be too sure about USC losing. Jackson, are you crazy? 90,000 people were at that game and saw Alabama win. I don't care if 100,000 people saw. I'm not taking the word of a lot of strangers. <laughs> That's the way rumors get started. <laughs> I'm not taking anybody's word. That's why Jack went to Europe last summer. He wanted to make sure the war was over. Yeah. He hasn't been to Japan yet, so he's still got his house blacked out. Mary, let's drop the whole... I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester. Rochester, you know I'm on the air. What did you call for? It's about Nottingham, your new English butler. He must be crazy. What's the matter now? 
When you left the house this morning, did you tell him to take the Christmas tree off the grand piano, cut it up into little pieces, and burn it? Yeah, did it fit in the fireplace? Oh, but the keyboard! <laughs> Rochester, do you mean to say that Nottingham damaged my grand piano? Damaged it? Boss, you know in front where it says Steinway and Sons? Yes. Well, the father's in business for himself now. <laughs> oh, my God. Rochester, why didn't you stop him? Stop him? Smart him. He wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> For my grand piano, it's ruined. I told you I saved the keyboard. The keyboard? Why would you just save that? Boss, you know how I feel about ivory. <laughs> I should have known. Well, Rasha, did anything else happen? Not until the fireman got there. The fireman? Yeah, when Nottingham threw the pen in the fireplace, the flame shot up all over the roof. Well, did the fireman put it out? They sure did. I went outside and watched them. They climbed up a ladder, stuck a hose down the chimney, and turned it on full force. Uh-huh. And, boss, I couldn't understand how a chimney could hold so much water till I opened the front door. <laughs> what? That tide hit me so hard, I thought Frank Thomas was coaching it. <laughs> Don't tell me the house was flooded. Flooded? You know that picture of Whistler's mother you got in the library? Yes. Well, the frame's still there, but she's in the living room diving for pennies. <laughs> Rochester, stop with the jokes. Did you save my parrot? Boss, the last time I saw your parrot, he was sailing down the hall in your derby hat shouting, Mr. Christian, come here! <laughs> Oh, don't be so silly. Now, let the water out the back door. We might as well water the garden while we've got it. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. What happened, Jack? What, what always happens when I leave the house? Come on, Phil, let's have a band. Now. That was Let It Snow, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Now, ladies and hey, gentlemen... Hey, Jackson, come on. How about paying me that dough you owe me on the Rose Bowl game? Phil, I told you I didn't see the game. But, Jack, you said you went to the Rose Bowl. How come you didn't see the game? Well... I'll tell you, Don. He wouldn't be interested. Yes, I would. What happened, Mary? Oh. Well, Jack had tickets for the game, and he told Phil and me to meet him in front of Tunnel 16 at 1.30. 1.30, 1.30. Where's the Jack? Who's it? Well, when Phil and I got to the bowl, Jack wasn't there yet. So we waited and waited. You should have seen the crowd down. There were thousands of people pushing and shoving. Come on, Phil. Let's go in. We can't, Libby. We've got to wait for Jackson. He's got the tickets. Why didn't he come with us? Well, you know how romantic Jack is. He's bringing his girlfriend, Gladys Abisco, to the game. Yeah, she's a pretty cute kid when she's all dressed up. You know, I think Jackson's kind of stuck on that little waitress. Yeah, but he's getting indifferent now that meat rationing is over. <laughs> you know him. Hey, Mary, Mary, look. Here comes Jackson and Gladys now. Gee, Gladys, I never saw you look so nice. You're sure pretty when you get all dialed up. Thanks, Speedy. <laughs> I mean it. Boy, am I lucky I met you. Ain't it the truth? <laughs> That's fate for you. You know, I'd never have met you if I hadn't been hungry that night. Yeah, I'll never forget. I was driving along looking for a place to eat, and I drove right past Ciro's and the Trocadero and the Macambo. And it was just fate that made me turn into Simon's Drive-In. <laughs> and there, like a vision of loveliness, you came toward me. Gee, you smelled so good. Yeah, it was chicken gumbo night. Uh-huh. 25 cents a bowl. A meal in itself. Oh, look, Gladys, there's Mary and Phil. Well, here we are, kids. Gladys, you know Mary, don't you? Sure. Hello, Mary. Hello, Gladys. Gee, that's a pretty fur. Did you trap it yourself? <laughs> I should say not. Speedy ran over it on the way out here. Gladys. Hit it again, Jackson. It's still wiggling. <laughs> Don't be funny. Gladys meant that it slipped off her shoulder and ran over it accidentally. Didn't you, Gladys? You tell him, big boy. You got the lips for it. <laughs> yeah. Come on, kids. Here's our gate. Let's go in. Tickets, tickets. Hold your own stubs, please. Here you are. Oh, hello, Gladys. Hello, Eddie. What's the special tonight? Beef soup and boiled potatoes. 
Oh, oh, come on, Gladys. Forget business for a while. Okay, Speedy. Here's Tunnel 16 over this way, Jackson. Now, let's stick together. Say, Gladys, you still work at the Shamrock Cafe? No, I'm back at the drive-in. Speedy thought I ought to be outside where it's healthy, yeah. <laughs> Darn right. What's the use of being in California if you can't enjoy the sun? Yeah, but I sure wish I could get off the night shift. <laughs> You will, honey. Just save your tips. That's all. I do, but every time I get a little ahead, you want to go to a movie or something? <laughs> well, it won't always be that way. Hey, look who's here. Hiya, Gladys. Happy New Year. Same to you, Lefty. Lefty? Hmm, you know everybody, don't you? That's Lefty Flanagan. What a sport. He always orders a la carte. <laughs> don't talk to him. But Lefty's a big tipper. Oh. Hi, Lefty. <laughs> now, let's see. Where do we... Hey, look, there's a hot dog stand. Let's make with a mustard. Yeah, want a hot dog, Gladys? I'm not hungry right now. You can get me one when we're inside. Better get one now, Gladys. You know Speedy. That's Speedy. <laughs> Here you are, kids. Take your hot dog. Thanks. Gee, I'm thirsty. What are we going to drink with our hot dog? Here you are, Gladys. Put that back in your pocket. <laughs> Now, let's go in. Stubbs, please. Let's see the numbers on your stubs. Here you are. Right this way. Just follow me. At... Oh, hello, Gladys. Why, hello, Nick. How are things? Fine. I'm on parole now. <laughs> come on. Come on. Show us our seats. Hey, look, mister. How about sitting someplace else? No, thanks. I never touch it. <laughs> hmm. This would happen to me. How much do you want to bet, Jackson? How much dough? Any amount you say, brother. Just name it. Okay, 50 bucks. $50? Okay, it's a bet. We must be sitting higher than I thought. <laughs> Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Peanuts, popcorn, chewing gum, peanuts, popcorn. Hello, Gladys, chewing gum. Oh, <laughs> well, hello, my For goodness sake, Gladys, must you say hello? Quiet, quiet. I want to hear the game. The game hasn't started yet. No, thanks. I never touch it. <laughs> Gee, they're a husky bunch of fellows. Yeah, listen to that crowd. Here they come running right past us. Hello, Gladys! 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 <laughs> now, look, I... But Speedy, dear, the boys on the USC team always eat at the drive-in. They voted me Miss Pigskin of 1945. I don't care what they voted you. Gosh, what a crowd. Yeah, I'll bet there's 90,000 people here. Oh, that's terrible. 90,000 people without a home. <laughs> What are you talking about? This housing shortage is terrible. Look, they've got homes. They're here for the game. Oh, you're just saying that because I'm your pal. You're not my pal. I never saw you before in my life. No, thanks. I never touched them. I don't know. I don't know why I always have to... Hey, Jackson, look. Here comes the Alabama team. Hey, those Alabama fellas look pretty good, don't they, Gladys? They sure do. Hello, Gladys, you all! Gladys, you all! That's the last straw. I'm leaving. I'm not even going to stay and see the game. And let me tell you something else, Gladys. You and I are through. Our engagement is broken. Goodbye. But, Speedy, if you're breaking our engagement, what about the ring? I'm not giving it back to you. <laughs> Goodbye. So there you are, Don. That's exactly what happened at the Rose Bowl on New Year's Day. Mary, I wish you'd stop telling Don everything that happens to me. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I won't do it again. Okay. Say, Mary, how would you like to go out to dinner now? And later we'll go dancing. No, not while you're wearing Gladys's ring. Well, I can't get it off. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Benny rehearses his radio program on Saturday afternoons. So let's go back to yesterday and pick up Jack and Mary on their way to the studio. Rochester is driving. Gee, Mary, it's a lovely day, isn't it? It sure is. Yes, sir. Give me California anytime. So nice and balmy, isn't it? Yeah. The air smells so good. 
You know, it's wonderful driving in weather like this. Uh-huh. Jack, let's put the top down. I wouldn't dare. <laughs> I tried that one. Rochester. Yes, boss? Why are you driving so slowly? I'm behind a big beer truck. Beer truck? Why don't you pass them? There's a loose case on the back, and the driver looks like the careless type. <laughs> Well, go on and pass them. There aren't very many big bumps on this street, anyway. <laughs> By the way, Rochester, did you take my dirty clothes to the laundry this morning? I sure did. And did you tell them about the lipstick on the collars of my white shirts? Yes, sir. Lipstick on your shirt? Mr. Benny puts it there himself to impress the girls at the laundry. <laughs> I do not. I got that at the Palladium. And while I'm thinking about it, I hope you told the laundry about my two pairs of shorts they lost. Uh-huh. They're going to get those back to you. They, they put them in Barbara Stanwyck's bundle. They they sent my shorts to Barbara Stanwyck? How could they make a silly mistake like that? I guess the Ruffles fooled them. <laughs> those aren't Ruffles. They're pleats. Pleats? Yes, please. Okay, horizontal, please. Stop being silly. And another thing, I hope you didn't forget to tell the laundry about my weak ankles. I told him. I told him. Weak ankles? What's that got to do with the laundry? They, uh, they put more starch in my socks. <laughs> a little, uh, a little faster, Rochester. We'll be late for rehearsal. Say, Mary, when we rehearse our program today, I want you to... Oh, tr- look, Jack, look. The Bells of St. Mary's is playing at the theater there. Oh, I sure want to see it. Me too. I hear it's wonderful. That's what everybody says. Jack, what picture do you think will win the Academy Award? Well, it's hard to say. There were several outstanding pictures. Lost Weekend, The Bells of St. Mary's, Spellbound, The Horn Blows at Midnight. Then there's... Oh, wait a minute, Jack. You don't think you got a chance to win the Academy Award for that picture, do you? I don't see why not. You know, I should have won it for my sensational acting in To Be or Not To Be. Well, why didn't you win? That is the question! <laughs> Rochester. No kidding, Mary. I'll never forget that scene when I threw the cloak over my left shoulder and said, To be or not to be, that is the question. Jack! Whether it is nobler in the mind. To suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. <laughs> or to take arms. Jack, we're driving. Sit down. <laughs> oh. Jack, the people on the sidewalk are applauding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to be or not Jack! to be. Jack! <laughs> jealous? I'm not jealous. I'm embarrassed. I'm mortified. You don't have to be. Anyway, that picture was one time I should have won the Academy Award. Well, this year, I think Ray Milan has a good chance to win it for his performance in Lost Weekend. Well, Ray was good in that picture, but I thought the plot was awfully flimsy. What are you talking about? It was a terrific plot. A fellow starts drinking and loses a whole weekend. So what? Phil Harris has been doing that for 15 years. <laughs> He thinks Monday comes right after Friday. (laughs) Anyway, I'll bet I'll win the award when I make my next picture. What's it going to be? A biography, the story of my life. Right from the time I was a baby. Uh, Did they have babies in those days? (laughs) No, no, Mary. They picked me off a mulberry bush. (laughs) And don't be so smart. You know, they dramatized my life last Sunday on that program called Freedom of Opportunity. I know. I heard it. Jack, is it true that when you were 15 years old, your father wanted you to be a concert violinist? Yes, that's true, Mary. But inwardly, I was fighting against it. In fact, I didn't realize it until my first performance. There I was, out on that concert stage, playing the Mendelssohn Concerto in E minor. And right in the middle of the number, something came over me. Tomato juice. (laughs) No. No, something besides that. But, who knows, if I'd have stuck to the violin, I might have been another Heifetz or an Isaac Stern or a Joseph Zagetti. By the way, Mary, Zagetti is giving a concert tonight in my hometown, Waukegan. I wish I could be there. If this wind keeps up, you've got a good chance. (laughs) Oh, it isn't so windy today. I don't know. This is the first time I ever coasted uphill. (laughs) Well, reef in the sail. We're at NBC. (laughs) 
Come on, Mary. Rochester, while we're rehearsing, take the car down to the corner filling station and have the oil changed. Okay, boss, but I don't think they'll do it the way you want it. What does he want, Rochester? He wants to trade the old oil in. <laughs> All right, have a change anyway, but take the old oil home. Yes, sir. Come on, Mary. Jack, you must be kidding. You don't really take your old motor oil home. Certainly, I can use it around the house. Oh, I thought that salad dressing had a lot of carbon in it. <laughs> that was pepper. Here we are, Mary. I wonder what studio we're supposed to... Well, here comes Charlie McCarthy. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Mr. Benny. Doo-doo-doo. <laughs> Hello, Charlie. Mary Livingston, why, you great big beautiful doll, you? <laughs> now, Charlie, you behave yourself. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Benny, but when you're as short as I am, you get nylon happy. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see you later, Charlie. Come on, Mary. Come on. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. Goodbye. You know, Mary, it's amazing how he gets around without Bergen. <laughs> yeah, I wish I'd asked my producer what studio we're rehearsing in. Jack. Jack. What? Oh, it's Edgar Bergen. Uh, hello, Mary. Jack, have you seen Charlie? Yes, he just went down the hall. Thanks. You know, every time I turn my back, he runs away. <laughs> Say, Jack. What? It's amazing how he gets around without McCarthy. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's see. Maybe we're rehearsing here in Studio G. This might be it. No, 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 gentlemen. Now, let's try it once more. This is it, Mary. Phil rehearsing his gentleman. Now, come on, fellas. Nice and smooth this time, with a little class to it. You know, lots of dignity. Okay, are you ready? A one, a two, a root, two, 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 to hit that. Mm, dignity. <laughs> yes. Okay, boys, you can relax now. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Livy. Hello, Phil. Hiya, Phil. How'd you like that number we just played, Jackson? Uh, pretty good, Phil. Uh, what's the name of it? I don't know. Uh, hey, Frankie, what was the name of that tune we just played? I don't know. Hey, Yeti, what was that tune we just played? That was Stardust. Uh, it was Stardust, Jackson. <laughs> No. No, it wasn't, Phil. I know how Stardust goes. Hey, fellas, Jackson said there wasn't Stardust. <laughs> hey, maybe it was Chickory Chick Chala Chala. Nah, that's a new one. We ain't learned it yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas, it, it, it really doesn't matter. It does to us, Jackson. We're musicians. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'll take your word for it. Now, Phil, we've got to start rehearsing the script, so tell your boys to take a rest for a while. Okay. All right, gentlemen, you can go. <laughs> Some musician. Oh, look! Somebody bent my saxophone. That's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> Amazing how much noise they can make in their bare feet. <laughs> now, is, is everybody here? Uh, where's Don Wilson? Here I am, Jack. And where's Larry? Here I am, right behind Mr. Wilson. Well, come around where I can see you. <laughs> now, kids, I've got a great thing to do on the program tomorrow. Uh, what is it, Jack? Well, I went to the movies last night and saw 20th Century Fox and Picture State Fair. And I enjoyed it so much that I've written a radio version of it. And believe me, it took some tricky writing. Now, Mary, in this play, you're going to be my wife. And guess what I'm going to be? What? Your husband. <laughs> Some tricky writing. Well, Mary, nowadays it's nice to know who your husband's going to be. Look what happened with Pappy Boyington. <laughs> Uh, Phil, you're going to be my neighbor, Zeke Martin. Zeke? Yes. I hope I got a brother named Hyde. Why? Then we can play hide and seek. <laughs> oh, Harris, you're six foot one and you're all mine. <laughs> I know that's what gives me the courage to go on. <laughs> Now, Larry, Larry, you're going to be my son, uh, Cy. 
Gee, Mr. Dunny, I'm much too old to be your son. Thanks, kid. <laughs> now, um... Now, Don... Don, you're going to play the part of Blue Boy, my prize-winning hog. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jack. Wait a minute. I don't want to play the part of a hog. I won't have any lines. Believe me, Don, you've got just the right line. <laughs> Now, remember, your name is Blue Boy, and you're going to win the Blue Ribbon. Jack, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to play the part of a hawk. Don, you made your stomach. Now lie on it. <laughs> now, remember, kids, in this play, we go to the Pomona Fair. Phil, have your musicians, uh, musicians come in and tell them to be quiet. Okay. All right, fellas, come on in and be quiet. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> Now, as the scene opens... Ah, <laughs> now, as our scene opens... <laughs> we find Lem Peabody and his wife at home preparing for the fair. All right, let's rehearse it. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Ben, Reuben, I've been thinking what a strange world this would be if all the men folks were transported far beyond the... Hey, Ma, Ma, what are you doing? Fixing the men's meat. You know, I'm aiming to win first prize affair this year. I'm the best cook in the county. You sure are, Ma. Look what happened last year. When the judge tasted my cooking, I knew I was going to be the winner. Yep. Too bad he dropped dead before he could announce it. <laughs> Forget his last words as he lay there looking up at me. What did he say, Ma? He said, I've been judging pies for nigh on to 50 years, but this one's out of this world and I'm a going with it. <laughs> no other judge could make that statement. <laughs> you know, Ma, I've been worried all week. I can't make up my mind which hog to take to the fair. Why, Pa, I thought you decided to take Blue Boy. I did, but you know my other hog, Esmeralda, is a lot smarter. Well, I guess I'll go down to the pen and look them over. See you later, Ma. Hey, Lamb. Hello, Lammy. <laughs> Sound like Lamb of Lemon Abner. <laughs> oh, hello, G. And I was just going down to the pen to look over Esmeralda and Blue Boy. I don't know which one of my pigs to take to the fair. Wouldn't you have more fun with your wife? <laughs> Why, Zeke, you've been reading Dr. Pierce's almanac again. <laughs> well, Lem, I don't care which pig you take. I bet you five dollars you don't win no prizes. Okay, to bet. To bet, just a second, I'll get up my money. What's the matter, Zeke? Ain't you never seen a man's leg before? <laughs> now, come on down to the pen with me, Zeke, while I look them over. Okay. Well, Zeke, we're getting near the pig pens now. Yep, and that reminds me. Have you been listening to that feller Jack Benny on the radio? <laughs> nope, I'm always busy at that time. Well, he's got a contest where he's giving away about $10,000. He's announcing the winners two weeks from tonight. <laughs> Darn fool, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. Look at those pigs, Zeke. Aren't they humdingers? Look at Esmeralda. Yeah. Look at that belly on Blue Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Come here, Esmeralda. Esmeralda, come here. Wee, 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 wee. Doggone, she's a fine-looking sow. I don't know. Blue Boy looks pretty good to me. Yeah. Come here, Blue Boy. Oink, 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 oink. <laughs> Look at him, Zeke. Weighs 2,800 pounds. Feel, feel his ribs. Go ahead. Feel his ribs. Okay. Oink, 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 oink. <laughs> He's so darn ticklish. <laughs> Say, Zeke, 
Zeke, uh, how do you like this setup I got here in the barnyard? Why, well, you're way behind the times, Lemmy, old boy. Now you take my cow barn for instance. Now I got it all modernized. I got telephones. Telephone? Yep. Now when a cow feels like she ought to be milked, she just takes the receiver off the hook and calls us at the house. Calls you at the house? Well, how can a cow dial the... Oh, oh, I see. <laughs> Zeke, let's go back to the house, see how Ma's getting along. Huh? All right. Come on, we we'll just walk down there, see Ma. Hey, Ma. Ma, here's Zeke. Hello, Zeke. Hello, Mrs. Peabody. What you making? <laughs> Mince meat. I'm taking it to the fair. Mince meat, huh? Yep, and to give it just the right flavor, I put in some brandy. Brandy? <laughs> yep, two tablespoons full. No, 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 Mrs. Peabody. You spoil the mince meat. <laughs> hey, Pa. What? Some tricky writing. <laughs> you said it, Ma. Well, excuse me, boys. I'm going upstairs and put on my new gingham dress. Okay, hurry up. Quick, Lamb, hand me that bottle of brandy. Now, wait a minute, Jeke. The way I wrote this play, you hate the taste of brandy. Well, hand me that bottle. I'm going to ad lib. <laughs> Okay, Zeke, but look at you go ahead and pour it into the mincemeat. I'll pour this bottle in, and then you pour another one in. All right, then. but let's hurry before more gets back. <laughs> there we are. Now, hide those empty bottles. I think you hear more coming. Okay. Well, Pa, I'm all ready to go to the fair. Let's get started. I'm ready, too. Before we go, maybe I'd better taste this mincemeat. Now, wait a minute, Ma. Wait a minute. Let me taste it. You know how crazy I am about your mincemeat. <laughs> all right. Go ahead. Mmm. Mmm. Better taste it again. Mmm. <laughs> better taste it once more. <laughs> Hmm. Well, Pa, how is it? Too much minch meat. <laughs> what? What'd you say? I said too minch munch meat. <laughs> I mean... He means too much mint meat. That's, that's what I said. Too much mint... You better mm- quit while you're ahead, Lamb. <laughs> better quit, Lamb. Yes. Well, come on. If we're all ready, let's go. <laughs> Everybody, everything ready there, Shy? Yes, Tom. <laughs> Put Esmeralda on the wagon and Blue Boy, too. That's good. One of them is bound to win the prize. Well, come on, boy. Come on, Shy. Come on, Lamb. Let's go. Okay. Get up, Dobbin. Get up. I bet this year's fair is going to be the best one yet. Come on up. Here we come. The winners of the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest will be announced two weeks from tonight, January 27th. On tonight's program, Edgar Bergen and Charlie MacArthur were impersonated by Ollie O'Toole. Okay, Phil, okay. Rehearsal is over. The band can go home. All right, fellas, you can go home now. Hmm. Mary, pick me up, will you? <laughs> Good night, folks. program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, just about one year ago, Jack Benny started on a trip to New York. He rushed down to the Union Station to find out about the chief or the super chief. But the only information he could get was... Train leaving on track five for Anaheim, Mazusa, and Cucamonga. <laughs> Last summer, Jack went to Germany to entertain our boys in the armed forces. As he waited for connections between Berlin and Nuremberg, he heard a voice say, Das diese Leute Tag wohnt, am guten Tod die Stunde, verboten für alle Heim, am Sofa und Sofa und Two years 
years ago when Jack was on a lonely island in the South Pacific. He was hiding behind a palm tree, watching the natives do their tribal dance. Suddenly, one of the natives spied Jack behind the palm tree. He advanced toward him with a sharp bolo knife. It was a tense moment as the native said, Got any gum, chum? No. <laughs> So now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who just last week was appointed honorary mayor of these three California cities, Jack Benny. Thank you, Don, and thank you, my loyal subjects. You may sit down now. Thank you. Oh, Jack, that was certainly a great honor bestowed on you. How does it feel to be mayor of three cities? Oh, it hasn't changed me a bit. I'm still the same lovable Jack Benny that nobody can stand. <laughs> you know, Don, this is the first time in history that one man was ever mayor of three cities at the same time. It's quite an honor. You know. I agree with you, Your Majesty. Mary, don't overdo it. Don't overdo it? What about you and those new cards you had printed? Fiorella H. La Benny. <laughs> Well, and walking around on your knees to make yourself look shorter. <laughs> Mary, I wasn't trying to imitate LaGuardia. You were too. You even tried to set fire to Betty Grable's house so you could be the first one there. <laughs> first one there. First one there. You're just jealous because I have influence now. Some influence. Tell Don what happened this morning when a cop stopped us for speeding. What was it, Mary? Jack stuck his head out of the car and said, Listen, buddy, you may not know this, but I happen to be the mayor of Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. And what happened? The cop gave him three tickets. <laughs> Now, wait a minute. Apparently, you kids have no respect for the importance of my new office. Now, Jack, you know that isn't true. Come in. Collect telegram for Jack Benny. Dollar 19. Oh, here you are, son. Dollar 19 for the telegram. And here's a dollar for you. Gee, thanks very much. I wonder who this telegram is from. It must be important if they send it here to the... Come in. Pardon me, Mr. Benny, I forgot my bicycle. You didn't forget it, I bought it. <laughs> now go. Okay, but you're going to look silly on those three wheels. <laughs> this, uh, this telegram's from, this telegram's from Fred Allen. He says, Dear Jack, have almost finished judging the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest letters. We'll have the winners in time for your next Sunday's broadcast. Stop. I know I've said a lot of nasty things about you, but after reading all those letters, I realize that I'm the only friend you've got. <laughs> Stop. It's amazing how so many people can call you such big things with such small words. <laughs> Some of them hyphenated yet. <laughs> hmm. Say, Jack, do you think Fred Allen will pick up one of his relatives as the winner of the contest? Gee, I hope not. Although Allen's relatives sent in twice as many letters as anybody else. Twice as many? How could they do that? Mary, when you're swinging by your tail from a tree, you can write with both hands. <laughs> And thanks for asking. <laughs> now, come on, Phil. Phil, let's have a band number. Phil. Phil. Phil isn't here yet, Jack. Good. Let's sneak the band number in before he gets here. Hey, you. You over there. Me? Yes, you. You lead the orchestra. But I'm the janitor. Just wave your broom. Those guys won't know the difference. Believe me. Now, go ahead, will you? That was a little fond affection played by Phil Harris's orchestra and conducted by the janitor waving a broom, proving that Mr. Harris belongs to the wrong union. <laughs> Say, janitor, how'd you ever learn how to lead a band? I used to play with Phil Harris's orchestra. You did? Well, what made you become a janitor? I got ambition. <laughs> oh, I should have known you were a musician. It's the first time I ever saw a broom with a mouthpiece. <laughs> 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction. Hi, you folks. Your future looks bright because Harris is here and there's good news tonight. <laughs> oh, yes, our good news tonight. <laughs> Well, the prima donna finally arrived. Uh, good afternoon, maestro. Hiya, Jackson. Sorry I'm late. Sorry. So, look, Phil, if you knew you were going to be late, why didn't you phone me? Phone you? Are them things working? <laughs> Certainly. The, the government intervened. Now, when you dial O, you get President Truman. <laughs> and, Phil, from now on, get here on time and cut out those loud entrances. I want a little respect around here. Respect? What's eating him, Livy? Him has just been made honorary mayor of Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Well, well, I beg you to accept my humblest apologies, coupled with my heartiest felicitations, Your Worship. <laughs> uh, thank you, Phil, but you don't have to curtsy. You know, Jackson, this is quite an occasion. This calls for a drink. Never mind. But, Jack, Phil's going out of his way to be nice. Out of his way. Mary, all you have to do is say, today is Tuesday, and Phil says, oh, boy, what an occasion. This calls for a drink. <laughs> Believe me, if I were the mayor of this town, I'd fix guys like Phil by putting on a curfew. Hey, Jackson, say that word again. Curfew. Kazoontite. <laughs> oh, Harris, you've got your own teeth, but you're clicking all the time. <laughs> Phil, who writes your material? Madman Munt. <laughs> I knew it couldn't be the smiling Irishman. Now, let's get on with Hey, the... Jackson, how do the people of Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga feel about you being appointed their honorary mayor? Well, I don't know, Phil, but Rochester's down there right now sort of feeling out the pulse of the citizens. In fact, he's conducting a poll. Now, let's forget about me and get on with the program, because tonight, in answer to many requests... We're going to continue with our radio version of William Pearlberg's 20th Century Fox picture, State Fair. Request? Yes. Our listener uh, wants to know if my prize hog, Blue Boy, will win the blue ribbon at the fair. Now, Mary, you'll be more Peabody, my wife. Phil, you'll be Zeke, my neighbor. Larry, you'll be my son. And Don, once again, you'll be my... Now, wait a minute, Jack. I don't want to play the part of a pig. <laughs> well, why not? It's not believable. I don't look anything like a pig. Well, maybe... Don, take off your glasses a minute. <laughs> there, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll continue our play where we... I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Rochester, I'm glad you called. Did you talk to the people in Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga? Uh-huh. Well, what do they say about me being appointed honorary mayor? Are you sitting down? <laughs> yes. Now, tell me, what do they say about me being mayor? Boss, you know those contest letters you've been getting that upset you so much? Yes. Well, they're made of the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder language. <laughs> Rochester, I can't believe it. What was the overall opinion in the three towns? Well, Anaheim is blaming Azusa, Azusa is blaming Anaheim, and Kuka is blaming Manga. <laughs> Kuka is blaming Manga, but that's all one town. All I know is half the people are dressed in blue, the other half in gray, and their battle song is Love in Bloom. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Are they shooting? No, they're just beating each other over the head with violins. Beating each other with violins. Anybody around here with a bass fiddle is a general. <laughs> Rochester, where are you phoning from? I ain't phoning. I'm using my walkie-talkie. Walkie-talkie? I'm in motion, boss. In motion. <laughs> Rochester, if things are that bad in Cucamonga, what happened in Azusa? I don't know, but I mentioned your name in Anaheim and two trees threw their oranges at me. Oranges? That was the naval artillery. Now, cut that out. Watch it, you're making this whole thing up. You can tell me about it when you get home. Goodbye. Goodbye. I hope Rochester gets here on time to go on request performance. I don't want to lose the commission. 
Now, Larry, before we start our play, State Fair, put us in the mood by singing something from the picture. Okay. That was That's For Me, sung by Larry Stevens and the Farmhands. Now we pick up where we left off last week, on our way to the State Fair. Ma, Pa, Zeke, Sign, the Pigs, and the Mincemeat are all on the wagon. Let's go. Giddy up, Dobbin. Come on, Nellie. Giddy up. Take it easy on them horses, Pa. <laughs> They're plugging as hard as they can. Say, Lemmy. Lemmy, no wonder your horses are having such a hard time pulling this wagon. Look at what your son is doing back there. Where? Son, stop dragging your head. <laughs> stop. Well, gee, Pa, Ma told me to do it. Well, that's Ricky Dickulous. <laughs> Dragging your head. No, it ain't, Pa. When he drags his feet, he wears his shoes out. Well, go right ahead, son. You need a haircut anyway. <laughs> say, Zeke, how do my pigs look back there? Oh, they're all right, but I, I still say they ain't gonna win no prizes. Oh, they ain't, huh? Just look at them beautiful pigs. Hello, Esmeralda. <laughs> And uh, how do you feel, blue boy? Oink, 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 oink. <laughs> he ain't even looking at you, Pa. Blue boy, I'm over here. Put your glasses on, you silly pig. <laughs> yes, sir, those are two of the finest pigs in Kumquat County. Maybe so, maybe <laughs> But I still say, Lemmy, they ain't gonna win no prizes. Well, we got a five dollar bet on that, ain't we? Yeah, we got a bet, but you ain't put up your five dollars yet. Oh. Well, here's my money. Hey, Lem, you must have had this five dollar bill a long time. What do you mean? It's got a picture of Lincoln lying on a bear skin rug. <laughs> I got that when the first came out. They knew he'd grow up to be president. Hey, Pa, look up ahead, all those tents and banners there. Yep, we're almost there. Giddy up, Dobbin. Gosh, Ma, ain't it exciting here? Mm, it sure is, Pa. All right, folks, step right up and I'll get your weight for a dime. One dime, win the Cupid doll. Lucky, 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 right this way for the girly show. All right, folks, now gather around. Here you are, get your genuine, solid gold, 17 jewel, switch watch, move wristwatches for only 39 cents. Hey, I'll buy one of them watches, mister. Now, there's an intelligent man. Here's your watch, mister. Okay, here's your money. I gather around, folks. Get your genuine salad. Hey, gold. hey, wait a minute. This watch don't look very shiny. It don't look like gold. You say the watch ain't shiny? You say it ain't gold? Tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> For only one thin dime, the tenth part of a dollar, I'm going to send you a bottle of marble. Marble, the only jewelry polish on the market that contains irium. <laughs> well, okay, if it's only a dime, give me a bottle Here's a quart And here's your bottle Step right up, ladies and gentlemen Get your salad Hey, gold hey, what about my change? Jewel Swiss movement wish watches for Hey, only... what about my change? Get away from me, bub your bottom <laughs> Yes, ladies and gentlemen, these watches are I ain't going away till I get my change You're just a big crook you say you didn't get your change? You say I'm a crook? Tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> you ain't going to do nothing. Oh, come on, Lamb. Stop making such a gall darn shamil of yourself. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go over. Say, and... Pa. Huh? Son, we're off the wagon. Stop dragging your head. Well, it ain't his fault, Pa. He's got the wrong tongue laced in his shoe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Doggone it. That happened. <laughs> That happens every time he dresses himself. Now, what do you want, son? I'm a getting hungry. Okay, you wait here with your ma and Zeke. I'll be back in a minute. Say, Pa, I'm going to take my mincemeat over at the judge's stand. See you later. Come on, son. Hey, Zeke. Zeke, now that Ma's gone, let you and me go over to the girly show. Well, now you're talking, Lemmy. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Lucky, lucky, 
be right this way, boys, and see Fifi Latour, the dancing girl. She shakes in every muscle. She shakes in every joint. If you think Mildred Pierce did something, step on the inside and see what Fifi does. Come on. Come on, Zeke. Let's go in. Okay, Lem. Hey, I wonder if the dancing girl this year is going to have a balloon or seven veils. I'm prepared for either one. I got a pin and seven matches. <laughs> Well, let's go in. Two tickets, please. There you are, and remember, no climbing on the runway. Come on, Z. Here's a couple of good seats right here, Zeke. Can't we get any closer? We're on the stage now. Hey, Zeke, here comes Fifi going into her dance. Look, Zeke, she's only walking up and down the stage. Yeah, but that kind of walking accentuates the positive. <laughs> you said it. Look out, she's winding up. <laughs> Whoops. Look at her. <laughs> she sure can do it. Look, she's dancing over this way again. <laughs> hmm. Hey, Lamb, pick up your hat. <laughs> Sure is a high kicker. Here she comes again. Look out! Hmm. Hey, Z. What? I bet Moore's a better cook than she is anyway. <laughs> yes, sirree. Hey, shall we wait for the next show, Z? Love it, love it. <laughs> Why, well, love your cute Peabody. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Now, you come right out of here. Okay, Moore, let go of my ear. I'm a-coming. While you boys are wasting your time in here, my mints meet one first prize. And so did Blue Boy. Yippee! You see, Zeke, I told you we'd win. And, Pa, do you know what the first prize is? What? A round-trip ticket to Anaheim, Azusa, and Cucamonga. Well, I'll be doggone! program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, today is January 27th, the day that the winners of the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest will be announced. Last night, people all over the country went to bed wondering if they would win part of the $10,000. So let's go back to last night, to the home of the man who is going to give away all that money. I don't know why I let myself get into this. It's a lot of dough. There ought to be some way to get out of it. Hmm, I wonder if I could... Oh, boss! I could go to Mexico. <laughs> no, nah, that's too close. Say, I've got it. Boss, if you're thinking what I think you are, it's impossible. Impossible? What do you mean? They can only send messages to the moon. People can't go there yet. <laughs> Rochester, I'm not running away. I'm just thinking about, uh, uh, my next summer's vacation. Then why did you pack your bags this afternoon? <laughs> you must know, I just threw some old clothes in those suitcases to send to the people in Europe. I know, but the one you sent to France is addressed to Pierre Benny. <laughs> <laughs> that goes to an uncle of mine in Paris. Now forget it. Okay, okay. But look, it's only $10,000. Why do you want to run away to Paris? Look, Rochester. No use hiding in those sewers, boss. They'll find you. They'll find you. <laughs> Rochester, cut that out. I told you I'm not going anywhere. All I know is when I answered the phone this morning, a man said, this is the Atchison Topeka in Santa Fe, and he wasn't singing. <laughs> Look, Mr. Jones, if you're... Uh, Van Jones, rather. If you're insinuating that I'm worried about giving away the $10,000, you're sadly mistaken. The letters of the contest have all been read. The winners will be announced. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm not even thinking about the money. Now, it's getting late, so I'm going to bed. Mmm, my watch is slow. What time you got, boss? $10,000. I mean, 10000 o'clock. 10000 10, Now, stop confusing me. I'm going up to bed. So am I. Good night. Good night. 
And Rochester, don't put the cat out tonight. With this meat shortage, you can't tell what'll happen. <laughs> well, good night, Rochester. Good night. <laughs> I get laughs like that on my program. <laughs> Why? Don't be impatient. You've only been on 14 years. Stop tormenting me, do you hear? Stop! We don't have to torment you. You're going to do it yourself. Tomorrow you have to give away all that money. And if you don't, do you know what they're going to do to you? They're going to tie you to a post, throw branches around it, cover you with gasoline, and then take your two old tired up legs and rub them together. <laughs> what? <laughs> and then they're going to tie you to a horse and drag you all over. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Boss! Boss! Huh? Oh. Well, I'm glad you came, Rochester. Just had an awful dream. I dreamt. Rochester, what are you doing with your suitcase? I had the same dream, and I'm going with you. <laughs> Thanks for your loyalty. And take off that beret. We're not going to Paris. Very good, Larry. Very good. That was Larry Stevens Okay, singing... Don. Okay, I'm here. I'll take over now. That was Larry Stevens singing symphony. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... The big ham. What? <laughs> What'd you say, Don? I said I love spam. Oh, okay. And now, get a load of Diet Smith Wilson. <laughs> and now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight. Oh, I know you don't, Jack. When anybody else is late around here, they have to have a good excuse. Mary's right, Jackson. You're late. Well, I couldn't help it. I was so tired. I didn't get much sleep. I tossed and turned all night. Oh, that happens every time Margaret or Brian beat you at hopscotch. <laughs> What are you talking about? I beat her three out of five. It was something else that upset me. Say, Jackson, it couldn't be by a slight coincidence that you didn't sleep last night because today you have to give away $10,000. Could it, little Mansy? <laughs> what $10,000? The contest money, you know. Oh, that. I forgot about it. Forgot about it? When Phil, Phil mentioned it, you're... Phil. Fa- <laughs> I got to do it all over again. Go <laughs> I'll when... take the first line. I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> forgot about it? Mm-hmm. When Phil mentioned that your face turned white, your lips turned blue, and your stomach turned over. That wasn't worth going over anymore. Anyway. <laughs> well, 
Mary. And the way your Adam's apple popped out, I thought it was going to announce the time. <laughs> announce the time, announce the time. All right, why shouldn't I be upset? Bad enough giving away all that dough without having a guy like Fred Allen tell me what to, who to give it to. What a judge. Well, Jack, I think Fred Allen's a great judge of humor. You do, eh? Well, I'll say one thing. His program has helped the good neighbor policy. Helped the good neighbor policy? How? Well, when Allen's program comes on the air, so many radios start clicking off that South America thinks we've taken up the castanet. <laughs> All right, but now that you're here, let's cut out this silly stuff and announce the winners of the contest. Mary, I don't know who the winners are, and I won't know until Steve Bradley, my press agent, gets here. I think I'll call his house and see what's keeping him. Say, Mabel, what is it, Gay Fib? <laughs> Mr. Benny's line is flashing. Yeah, I wonder what Dorian Gray wants now. <laughs> I'll take it. Yes, Mr. Benny. Steve Bradley at Crestview 67071. Huh? I'm sorry, Mr. Benny, but on local calls, we can't reverse the charges. <laughs> I'll call you back when I get the number. What did he want, Geisha? He wanted I should get him a number. <laughs> Say, Geisha, did you enter Mr. Benny's contest? Well, I almost did. You see, I started to write in 50 words why I can't stand Jack Benny. Uh-huh. And by the time I finished writing, I sold it to Universal, and they're making a picture out of it starring Gordon <laughs> Carlock. <laughs> what a character that Benny is. Ain't it the truth? I'll never forget the first time I went out with him. We were sitting in the park in the moonlight, holding hands, and suddenly he whispered in my ear and asked me for a lock of my hair. Gosh, how romantic. Romantic nothing. He made a toupee out of it. <laughs> Why, Mabel Flapsaddle. <laughs> You're just making that up. Now it's the truth. Say, Gertrude, did you ever go out with Mr. Benny? Dear, I did. And gee, I'll never forget our first date. He showed up wearing a pair of wooden shoes. Wooden shoes? Yeah, when he says Dutch treat, he ain't kidding. <laughs> you said it. You know, Gertrude, one day Mr. Benny asked me if I'd like to be on his radio program. He did? Yeah. He wanted to put me in pictures, too, but that's an old gag. <laughs> no, it ain't. Mr. Benny has a lot of influence. He got me a part in that picture last weekend. Last weekend? What did you do in it? I stuck the labels on the bottles. <laughs> Gee, Gertrude, I saw the picture, but I didn't see you. I know. After the first day, they fired me and hired a wet sponge. <laughs> What a career. <laughs> operator, operator. Oh, Gertrude, did you get Mr. Bradley for me? No, he doesn't answer. All right, well, keep trying. What happened, Jack? I don't know. Bradley isn't home. I wonder if he could be at... Oh, there's the telephone. Correct. Now, would you like to try for $8? What? I have a lady in the balcony, Doctor. Ask her if you've got a friend. Now, cut that off! <laughs> Everybody wants to be a comedian. This is liable to... Hello? Hello, boss. Have you given away the prize money yet? No. Why? One Z, two Z, no time to lose Z. Two Z, three Z, listen to me Z. Seven Z, eight Z, better not wait Z. Let's get going for Paris. Why? <laughs> this is just a little thought, boss. So long. Well, the first time I, first time I ever knew Rochester, listened to my program. Uh, maybe he read that fine print in his contract. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it's a cute song. I bet it'll be a hit. I can't wait till I get home tonight and learn it on my violin. No, 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 Jackson. Let it live. It's so young. <laughs> Bill, when I learn a number on my violin, it always... Come in. Hello, 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 everybody. Hello. Long time no see, huh? Well, it's about time you got here, Steve. I've been trying to get you on the phone. What took you so long? I'm going to get excited, buddy. It was my new publicity stunt for you. I just hired an airplane and a pilot to write your name all over the sky, but I ran into a little trouble with him. Trouble? What was wrong? 
force of habit, he can't get his last job for all life. <laughs> oh. Say, Steve, didn't hear the names of the contest winners. The judge had a long talk with him. Did he mention any names? Plenty. He called you a dirty nope. I mean the name. <laughs> hmm. Come on, Steve. Tell us, uh, uh, tell us who Jack has to pay the money to. Mary, if I can wait, you can, too. We won't announce the winners till the end of the program. Oh, for crying out, oh, you were going to... Stop giving him ideas. <laughs> he didn't give me the idea. I've been thinking of it for weeks. <laughs> the silliest thing I ever heard in all my 37 years. Hell, <laughs> shit, say so. You had a gleam in your eye. Oh, for goodness sake, Jackie. Tell us the name nervous. Now, come on. All right, I guess you're all pretty anxious, so I won't keep you... I'll get it. Hello? Gertrude, I know... Next... Now, Gertrude, you talk a little more... What? Well, not. <laughs> Goodbye. That girl, you cute when she gets... Timeless. Uh, Let's see if announce the winners. All right, all right. All right. Go ahead, Steve. We ain't finished. We're all wet. Oh. oh, my goodness. Hello? Oh, hello, Mabel. But, Mabel, I'm not a beast. I didn't mean to make her cry. Put her on the phone. Let me... T- oh. oh. Well, when she comes back, tell her to call me. <laughs> Goodbye. I never saw anyone as sensitive as Gertrude. Just say boo, she starts crying. Her mother was the same way. <laughs> well, go ahead, Steve. Let's hear the winner. Okay. If there's pick five the judges, Peter Laurie and Goodman Ace. But you're going to hear them announced by the final judge himself, the Honorable Fred Allen. Why? Are we all... Take it away, New... Goodman, this is Fred Allen in New York. I wouldn't want precedent. But I know you've all been waiting for the winners of the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest. So here they are. The first prize, wake up, Mr. Benny, this isn't a dream now. The first prize, $2,500 in Dickley bonds, goes to Mr. Carol P. Craig Sr., 735 Radcliffe Avenue, Pacific Pal- uh, Palisades, California. The second prize, $1,500 in Dickley bonds, goes to Mr. Charles S. Doherty, Hotel Bolton Square, Cleveland 6, Ohio. The third prize, a $1,000 victory bond, goes to Miss Joyce O'Hara, 1014 Dragoon Avenue, Detroit 9, Michigan. The additional 50 winners of the $100 bonds will be notified by telegram and the bond sent registered mail. P.S. If Mr. Benny should deliver any of these telegrams personally... Please tip him generously, ladies and gentlemen. He's been through a terrible ordeal, I am happy to say. Good night, folks. Your father's not that. Well, the contest is over. And you want to know something, Mary? I don't feel bad at all. I feel like I've got something off my chest. Maybe it's your money belt. Maybe. Play (laughs) belt. Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday we're going to have as our guest Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman and one of the world's greatest violinists, Isaac Stern. Now that the first three winners of the contest have been announced, I would like to announce as many of the names of the $100 bond winners as time will allow. First, Helena Williams, 1809 West Sherman, Phoenix, Arizona. Miss Ruth Payne, 909 Chester Avenue, Topeka, Kansas. Mrs. Dorothy Pickering, 28 Soundview Drive, Greenwich, Connecticut. Captain Alfred J. Helfond, 3311 Northeast 19th Avenue, Portland, Oregon. Mary E. Fleck, 208 North Princeton Avenue, Fullerton, California. E. Amale, 401 North Piedmont Street, Arlington, Virginia. Harris V. Patel, 27 South 1st Street, Bergenfield, New Jersey. Philip H. Clark, 1524 Osage Avenue, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Mrs. Florence Livingston. Well, Jamestown, Texas. M.G. Well, that's all we have time for, but you'll all get your telegrams and your bonds. Thank you very, very much. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Jack 
Benny program. Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Jack Benny is taking Mary to a concert at the Philharmonic Auditorium given by one of the world's greatest violinists, Isaac Stern. As we look in on Jack, he's at home dressing for the occasion. Rochester, I still think they're a little too short. They barely reach my ankles. Maybe I can let the cuffs out. No, if you let the cuffs out, they'll be too long. Lot of drag. Gosh, I wish they fit better. What's the difference, boss? After you put your pants on, who sees your underwear? <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. You're certainly going through a lot of trouble getting dressed tonight. Well, Rochester, all the important people in town will be at the concert. After all, Isaac Stern is one of the world's greatest violinists. Oh, come now, boss. You'll play the violin as good as he does. No, I don't, Rochester, no. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. I do not. Well, I think so. Rochester, you've never even heard Isaac Stern. Well, take advantage of it, boss. Take advantage of it. <laughs> Oh, I see. Well, you know, Rochester, maybe if I had followed my musical career, it might be me giving that violin concert tonight. Me, Yasha Benny. <laughs> I can just picture the scene. As I walk out on the stage, the spotlight falls on me. Me, Yasha Benny. <laughs> Confidently, I lift my violin and tuck it under my chin. I raise my bow. 5,000 pairs of eyes are staring at me. Say, Yasha, you better put your pants on. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, help me. You know, Rochester, it's a little unfair. I have to go through life being a clown, a buffoon, while inside, deep down inside, I have a yearning for the finer things. You could have some of those things, boss, if you just loosen up a little. <laughs> I suppose so, but then, again, you do have to think of the future. After all, Rochester, I haven't got much money. I don't know. Every time I turn your mattress over, Wall Street drops three points. <laughs> Rochester, let's drop the subject and just help me get ready for the concert. Hand me my dress shirt. Here you are, boss. White tie or black? The white tie and my tails, too. I haven't worn this suit in a long time. How do my tails look? Pretty good, boss, but you shouldn't have had the tails starched. Starch. Well, I figured it would hold them in place. I know, but when you bend over, you look like a sparrow. <laughs> no, I never thought about that. Come in. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Jackson. Well, well, look at our little boss all dressed up. My, my, my. What new drive-in is opening tonight? <laughs> Phil, I'm not going to a drive-in. I'm going to the Philharmonic. Isaac Stern is playing. Yeah? Against who? <laughs> Against nobody. He's a soloist. He plays the violin. You know, it wouldn't hurt you to go to a concert once in a while. Never saw a guy take less of an interest in his profession. What do you mean, no interest? You know darn well that I'm a musician. Phil, just because you have a picture of Patrillo tattooed on your chest doesn't mean you're a musician. <laughs> You and that band of yours. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. You've been riding my boys long enough. My orchestra is not as bad as you so unprovocatively infer. Unpro what? Huh? No, you don't. I ain't going to try that one again. <laughs> no, no, Phil. Go ahead. I'd like to see how it comes out the second time. I mean, go ahead. Okay. My orchestra is not as bad as you so unprovocatively infer. Say, hey, that's pretty good. So where'd you pick up that word? Phil. Phil, answer me. Wait till I get this knot out of my tongue. <laughs> I thought it would throw you. Well, it's getting late. I gotta leave now. Meet Mary in front of the auditorium. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is Don Wilson. Oh, hello, Don. What do you want? Well, I heard you were going to Isaac Stern's concert tonight, and I was just wondering if you could get a couple of tickets for me. Well, I don't think so, Don. It's been sold out for weeks. Oh, gee, that's a shame. I'd love to go. I'd even pay double the price. Well, I'm afraid it's... You would? <laughs> well, no, Mary's probably dressed already. I mean... <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 
I'm sorry, Don. There's nothing I can do for you. Well, thanks just the same, Jack. Goodbye. Well, I got to run along now. Goodbye, Phil. So long, Jack. And Rochester, you can have the rest of the night off. Thanks, boss. When will you be back? Tonight. I only got 35 cents. You can't lose a weekend on that. <laughs> I guess not. Goodbye. Here I am, Mary. Here I am, right over here. Okay, Jack. Just a minute. I'm sorry, sailor, but he showed up. <laughs> Come here. Who are you talking to? Oh, some sailor. His boat just anchored at Hollywood and Vine. Well, here we are, Mary, at the Philharmonic. How do I look? Mm, you certainly dressed swanky for the concert. White tie, top hat, and a bag of peanuts. Well, I thought you might enjoy something after the show. You know? <laughs> now, let's go in. But, Jack, the main entrance is around the corner. I know, but i got to go backstage and see Isaac Stern first. Come on. I wonder where his dressing room is. Maybe it's around here somewhere. This, this must be it right here. Come in. Uh, Mr. Stern? Yes, I'm Isaac Stern. Uh, Mr. Stern, this is Miss Livingston. How do you do? How do you do? And I'm Jack Benny. Jack Benny? Yes. Uh, you see, when I heard you were giving a concert in Los Angeles, I sent you money for two tickets, knowing that you'd get me the best seats available. Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Benny. I have the tickets right here. Here you are. Thanks. Wait a minute. These tickets are a dollar ten. I distinctly remember sending you... I did my best, Mr. Benny, but the house was sold out, and they didn't have any more seats available at the price you requested. Oh. So I added 30 cents of my own money and... <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stern. I hope I didn't impose on you too much. You see, you being a concert violinist, naturally, I felt that we have something in common. <laughs> yes, sir. We have something in common? Uh, yes, Jack's violin has four strings, too. <laughs> Mary. Mary, please. Jack, give Mr. Stern the 30 cents you owe and let's go. Oh, yes, yes. Just a minute. There you are. Ten, twenty, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Uh, there you are, Mr. Stern. Thank you. Okay, Jack, put on your shoe and let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Stern, and thanks for getting my tickets. You're welcome. Goodbye. Come on, Mary. Tickets, tickets, please. Hold your own tickets. Here you are. Thank you. Stairway to your left, please. Come on, Mary. Oh, Usher, where are these seats? Uh, stairway to your left, please. Come on, Mary. Oh, Usher. Usher, where are these seats? Yeah, let me see. Uh, row A, seats three and five. You see that last aisle over there? Oh, yes, yes, good. Well, take the stairway right next to it. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Gosh, what a climb. Oh, Jack, I can't go on. Give me another peanut. <laughs> Here you are. Oh, Usher. Yeah. <laughs> are these... <laughs> are these seats in this balcony? Yes, right over here. Gee, this is awfully high, isn't it? We used to think so, but now they can reach us by radar. <laughs> Don't be funny. Just show us to our seats. Just follow me. Here you are. Your seats are right here. Thank you. Say, these seats are all right, Mary. I can relax and put my feet up on the railing. And you better take your hat off. The spotlight will burn a hole through it. <laughs> I'll watch it. I'll watch it. 
Say, Mary, we may be in the top balcony, but at least we're in the front row. Can you see the stage all right? No, but I got a wonderful view of Catalina. <laughs> That's a painting on the wall. Here, have a peanut. Gee, there's sure a lot of people here tonight. Yeah, this place is certainly... Hey, Mary, look. Look way down there. Isn't that Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman? Where? Way down there below us, to the left of that cloud. Ronnie, weren't we lucky to get such good seats? Well, we certainly were, Benita. Mr. Stern plays the Mendelssohn Concerto. Well, now, let's see. He's going to play a sonata by César Franck. Then, uh... oh, yes, here it is, the Mendelssohn Concerto. And he follows with La Campanella by Paganini. Which one of those numbers do you like the best? Oh, it doesn't make any difference to me. I just came here to get away from chickory chick chala chala. <laughs> that I know he won't play. No, Jack, that isn't Mr. and Mrs. Coleman. I'm sure it is. Oh, Ronnie! Ronnie! Benita! yoo -hoo! Jack, Jack, everybody's looking up at us with their binoculars. Let them look. <laughs> They're jealous because we know the Colemans. Oh, Ronnie! Ronnie, yoo -hoo! Ronnie, isn't that Jack Benny up there trying to get our attention? Yes, it, it's embarrassing, but don't look up. <laughs> least wave to him. After all, he is our next-door neighbor. Benita, that is a situation which the housing shortage prevents me from doing anything about. <laughs> He's going to so much trouble to attract your attention. He's dropping little bits of paper. <laughs> He's dropping peanut shells. Uh, if he spits, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> What, what's he doing way up there, anyway? Well, perhaps his doctor recommended a higher altitude. <laughs> Where he's sitting is cheaper than the Alps. Mm. It's higher, too. Yeah, so it is. <laughs> well, anyway, dear, he won't be throwing any more peanuts. Oh, how do you know? I just got hit on the head with the bag. <laughs> Remarkable. He must be using a Norden bomb sight. Isn't that awful, Mary? I just can't seem to attract their attention. Oh, Ronnie! Ronnie, Benita, you who? Jack, don't lean so far over the rail. Ronnie, you Isn't it awful? He just won't give it up. I beg your pardon, sir, but I think there's somebody trying to get your attention. No. My attention? Yes, that man up there hanging from the rail by his heels. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. You know, Benita, I thought that the horn blows at midnight would keep him home for a couple of years. <laughs> Well, then, I guess some people don't know when... Ronnie, what was that thing that just fell in your lap? Oh, for heaven's sake. What is it? A toupee. <laughs> A toupee. Do you think it belongs? I'm afraid so. Look at the laundry mark. <laughs> and, and look what it says right... Uh, look what it says right below it. If lost... Will Finder, please read the lost and found columns in the Beverly Hills newspapers. The article in question will be referred to as a cocker spaniel with a cold nose and a part on the side. <laughs> oh, look, Ronnie. They're starting to dim the lights. Oh, darn it, I almost had their attention. Oh, look, honey, they're starting to dim the lights. Don't get fresh, mister. I happen to be here with an escort. Mary, it's me. It slipped off. <laughs> Well, put your hat on, you look awful, and be quiet. The concert's about to begin. Yeah, here comes Isaac Stern now. Bravo, bravo, encore, encore, bravo! Yeah. Love and blue, love and blue! Yeah, yeah, for heaven's sake! Chickory chick, chala, chala! Chickory chick! Where's up there, quick? Have your checks ready for your coat. Uh, boy, here's my check. Oh, no, you don't, Bob. I was... 
Ronnie. Jack, Jack, old boy. What a surprise seeing you here. Yes, yes. Wasn't that concert wonderful? It certainly was, and I loved the Mendelssohn Concerto. Well, I did, too. However, I felt that he had just a little too much pizzicato in the Andante. Uh, didn't you? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> Well, it sounded that way by the time it got up to me. <laughs> Here's your coach, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, good night, Jack. My best to marry. Good night, Ronnie. Give my love to Benita. I will. Oh, by, by, by the way, Jack, did you lose a cocker spaniel? <laughs> Why, yes, yes. Well, don't worry. Here, Lassie has come home. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye, Ronnie. You know, Benita, I think that's one of the finest concerts I ever heard. It's absolutely wonderful. I say, this isn't my coat. There must have been a mix-up at the cloakroom. Are you sure? Yes, I'm positive I had... Certainly, look at the label. Why, this is Jack Benny's coat. Jack Benny's? Yes. Oh, well, tomorrow they will have to... Well, Ronnie, what are you looking at? Huh? Oh, oh it's this address book I found in Benny's coat pocket. Address book? Yes. You know, he's always boasting about his influential friends. Well, listen to this first name. <laughs> Gladys Zibisco, Gladstone 0338. Gladys Zibisco. Mm. Here's a note he's written alongside her name. It says, Do not kiss too hard, has pivot to. <laughs> really? <no. laughs> yeah. and, and listen to this next name, Marcella Fink. And then he has in parentheses, Approach from the right, she's left handed. <laughs> That's interesting, friends. Oh, what's that? Folded sheet of paper that just fell on the floor. Well, oh, Benita, look, it's, it's one of his contest letters. Oh, you mean the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest? Yes, and there's a little notation on it that says, This letter was written by Carol P. Craig Sr. and won first prize. First prize? Oh, Ronnie, I wondered what the winning letter was right. Read it, please. All right. It says, I Can't Stand Jack Benny because... He fills the air with boasts and brags and obsolete, obnoxious gags. The way he plays his violin is music's most obnoxious sin. His cowardice alone, indeed, is matched by his obnoxious greed. And all the things that he portrays show up my own obnoxious ways. Now, you know, Benita, that's very clever. Yes, it has such a good thought behind it. Yes. And all the things that he portrays show up my own obnoxious way. You know, Benita, maybe the fellow that wrote this letter is right. The things that we find fault with in others are the same things that we tolerate in ourselves. That's so true, Ronnie. It certainly is. Hey, Jack, wasn't Isaac Stern wonderful? Absolutely terrific. Jack, I'll make you a sporting proposition. What is it? I'll break my leg if you'll break your violin. <laughs> I will not. <laughs> After all, Mary, I... Say, wait a minute. This isn't my coat. I've got on somebody else's coat. What? L look at the label. It's Ronald Coleman. Funny, I must have a mistake at the cloakroom. I wonder what he's got in his pocket. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, Lori. Mary, look. Isn't this cute? Well, what is it? A yo-yo. <laughs> Black sweet. Good night, son. <laughs> Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're broadcasting from Palm Springs, California. Palm Springs, the garden spot of the desert, where the star of our show went for a cold and caught one. And here he is, Jack... Achoo! Gesundheit Benny! Thank 
you. Thank Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And, Don, I wish you wouldn't give a false impression about the climate in Palm Springs. It just so happens that I was sitting in the sun and it was so hot, I caught this cold fanning myself with a Florida newspaper. <laughs> The weather is beautiful here. I know, Jack, but why does the sun go down so early? Don, it comes up in the morning, takes a look at the prices, and ducks behind the mountain. But it's really... But it's really wonderful here, Don. There's so much to do. Ah, it certainly is, Jack, and I've been taking advantage of it. Sunbathing, swimming, horseback riding... Wait a minute, Don, wait a minute. You mean you found a horse that could hold you up? Well, yes, Jack. I was riding a brown horse. You passed me on the trail. What are you shouting for? <laughs> Call me on a trail. <laughs> was that you? I should have known. First time I ever saw a horse with arch support. <laughs> and a cane yet. That horse was so sway back, you looked like you were riding a slice of cantaloupe. <laughs> I told my writers once, I told them a thousand times, that joke is no good. I told them... Leave <laughs> it in anyway. But I'm pretty clever. Just think, a few weeks ago, there were people who couldn't stand me. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hey, Mary, I've never seen you look so good. You've only been here a week, and you've got such a beautiful tan. You must have been out in the sun a lot. Yeah, I wish I could find a room. <laughs> Awfully crowded here. You're not kidding. Yesterday I put a penny in a gum machine, pulled the lever, and a woman stuck her head out and said, Sorry, no vacancy. <laughs> Mary, if we weren't in Palm Springs, I think you were making that up. Huh? I didn't believe it myself till I saw the sign. The sign? Yeah, it said, Please do not shake machine, you'll wake up the baby. <laughs> oh, yes, I, uh, I know that gum machine. It's called the Juicy Fruit Hacienda. <laughs> <laughs> They're booked up until April. Oh, by the way, Mary, I saw you riding a bicycle down Palm Canyon Drive. You look very cute in your sunsuit. Well, thanks, Don. You look cute in yours, too. What? (laughs) Don, now, you walking around in a sunsuit? That takes a lot of courage. Jack, what about you? A lot of sunsuit, too. (laughs) (laughs) Don Wilson is the only guy I know who gets his suntan oil at a filling station. (laughs) What are you saying? What are you saying? Um, 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 oh. Oh, Jack, what about you and that corny cowboy outfit? Let's repeat that. What you say? Uh, what about you and that corny cowboy outfit? Oh, I looked all right. And those high heel shoes you were wearing. Wow. Well, that shows how much you know. For your information, young lady, all cowboys wear high heel shoes. With open toes, you're crazy. <laughs> well, I had to cut them. They hurt my feet. What a cowboy. You should have seen him, Don, swaggering around town with two guns in his belt. Three. One's a cigarette lighter. (laughs) Anyway, Mary, when you're in Palm Springs, you're supposed to dress like a tough westerner. Some tough westerner. Your spurs still have dough in them from cutting out cookies. (laughs) Well, you ate most of them, sister, so don't be funny. I know what's cooking. Okay, folks, the show may be flopping, but now Harris is here to start things popping, so shower me with that sun-kissed applause. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wish, Phil, I wish you wouldn't sneak in here like that. Now, let me ask you something. Why didn't you show up for rehearsal yesterday? Where were you? Well, I'm sorry, Jackson. You see, I couldn't get a room in Palm Springs, so I'm staying out at the B Bar H. Oh, the B Bar H, huh? What are you living in? A room or a cabin? In the bar. In the bar. It's it's crowded out there, too. <laughs> Hard to guess that, you know. You must have loved that. Bill. No, no. Not anymore, partner. I'm on a wagon. You on the wagon? Yes, sir. All I take is two drinks a day. Well, if you're on the wagon, you shouldn't drink anything. Look, Jackson, my stomach's like a steel mill. You can shut it down, but don't let the fire go out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. That right arm of yours is a pretty good stoker, too. Now, it's uh, time for a band number. Are your boys ready to play? Yeah, Jackson, but I forgot to bring the music. You didn't forget it, brother. I hit it. <laughs> music only confuses them anyway. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Let's don't start that again. You've been riding my boys long enough. My orchestra is not as bad as you so unprovocatively infer. There he goes with that word again, unprovocatively. Phil, you used that same word last Sunday. Look, when I spend the whole winter learning something, I ain't gonna throw it away on one broadcast. <laughs> well, Phil, unprovocatively or not, all I know is when your band plays a number, it sounds like a filibuster with instruments. Now, go ahead and Hold play. it, hold it a minute. Jackson, what was that lovely word you just said? Filibuster. Filibuster? Gee, I already know unprovocatively, and now filibuster. Say, Jackson, how you spell filibuster? C-A-T. Now, well, go ahead and play. C-A-T, filibuster. I'll have to remember that. Yeah, do, do. Play something. That was, uh... That was Dr. Lawyer, Indian Chief, played by Phil Harris, and his sweetest music, this side of a Cathedral City Orchestra. <laughs> what a band. They look like a whole month of lost weekend. Uh, and now... And now, ladies and gentlemen... Okay, Jackson, okay. But I still say my orchestra is not as bad as you so unprovocatively infer. There he goes again. Phil, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say this. If my band is as loud as you say it is, why do you have them on your program? Because I feel it's my civic duty to keep them off the street. <laughs> That's why. What a bunch of guys. Every time we have a sound effect of a police siren, they throw up their hands and holler, We was framed. <laughs> Then they get into a big argument over who's going to ride on the back step. <laughs> some musicians. Bill, how long have you had your boys been with you? About 14 years. So you ought to buy them some new clothes. <laughs> the numbers on their shirts are beginning to fade. <laughs> Dress them up a little. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Jackson, I'm telling you for the last time, my band is not as bad as you so unprovocatively filibuster. <laughs> Filibuster? C-A-T, C-A-T. <laughs> Go away, will you? How do you like that? May I tell him C-A-T spelled filibuster? He believes it. Well, I think it's a shame, though, you take advantage of Phil just because he's a dope. You tell him, Libby. <laughs> <laughs> but, Mary, it, it's such a simple word, filibuster. Oh, sure. I'll bet you don't even know what it means. I do, too. The filibuster is when a man gets up and, well, he says a lot of things that don't quite... Well, he, he rambles on and on. That's a tobacco auctioneer. <laughs> I don't mean him. What I mean well, is... Well, Mary, Mary, what Jack is trying to say is that a filibuster is an innocuous speech, the main purpose of which is not to necessarily convey subject matter, but to deliberately delay the introduction of controversial issues. I never should have gone on the way. <laughs> Quiet, Phil. Now, now, I'll give you an example. If I knew that Jack was going to cut my salary, I'd prevent him from telling me by filibustering. That's what a filibuster is. Now, let's get on with the... I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. Rochester, you know I'm in the middle of a program. Do you have to call me now? Well, this is an emergency. Every time you drive my car any place, there's an emergency. What happened now? Well, boss, you know after you pass Riverside where the highway runs parallel to the railroad tracks? Yeah. I was driving along, minding my own business, and as I passed the train, the engineer stuck his head out and yelled, which way to Palm Springs? Uh-huh. And I made the fatal mistake of saying, follow me. Follow oh, you? Rochester, are you trying to tell me you had a wreck with the train? Boss, let's just call it a mismating of a metallic personality. <laughs> what? If a train pulls into Palm Springs wearing fender pants with a sharp crease, they're yours. <laughs> this is terrible. Which train was it? Well, now it's the Atchison Topeka and Chevrolet. <laughs> Now I'll have to buy a new car. You better buy some new clothes, too. New clothes? You know that hook on the train that picks up the mailbag? Yes. It's got your laundry. My <laughs> laundry. Rochester, all my shirts were in that bag. Don't worry, boss. I wired ahead to the next station. What do you say? No start. <laughs> See, I didn't know the Harvey girls were ironing on the side. Now, Rochester, you get out here the best way you can, will you? Oh, okay, goodbye. Goodbye. My 
my car didn't have nine lives, I don't know what I'd do. That was... That was Aren't You Glad You're You, sung by Larry Stevens. Very good, Larry. And now, kids, after the show tonight, I want you all to come over to my place and have some sandwiches and coffee. You know, I've, uh, I've got uh, Eddie Cantor's house here. Oh, you have? <laughs> Mary, what's so funny about my having Eddie Cantor's house? Well, tell Don how you got it. Mary, it's not that important. I got the house. That's all that counts. <laughs> well, anyway, Don, here's the way it happened. It happened. It happened. <laughs> Jack and I came down <laughs> to Palm Springs last Monday. When we arrived in town, we parked the car and walked down the street looking for a real estate agent. Mary, isn't Palm Springs wonderful? You know, I like to come down here. It's the only chance I get to wear my cowboy suit. Jack, don't walk so fast. The sand gets in my open toe shoes. Mine, too. <laughs> See, I'm getting hungry. So am I. Let's get something to eat. All right, maybe we can... Well, we're in luck. There's a hot dog stand. Some luck. You wait here. I'll be right back. Here you are, Mary. Here's your hot dog. Jack, I don't think hot dog's going to do me. I want a regular lunch. But, Mary, to us, these were ten cents apiece. To us? Well, how much are they to other people? Ten cents. Who do you think we are? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, if we eat these, we won't be wasting time. I have to find a place to live here. Well, first, let's have a regular lunch. All right, come on. We'll go over to the dunes. That's a nice restaurant. <laughs> It's sure crowded today. I hope we get a table. Yeah. Here comes the... Oh, pardon me. Are you the waiter? Well, what do you think I am with this shirt, tie, and shoes on? A guest? <laughs> I thought I could get away from him down here. I'd like to get a table for two, please. As soon as I have one, go into the bar and I'll call you. I don't want to go into the bar. Well, go somewhere. I can't stand you here. <laughs> now, look, we came in here to get something to eat. And if you don't show... Stop that... breathing on my discharge button. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. All I want... Say, Jack, Jack. What? Isn't that Eddie Cantor sitting all alone at that table? Eddie Cantor? Where? Oh, yeah, maybe we can sit with him. Yeah, that's Eddie. Gee, I hope I look as good as he does when I'm his age. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's go sit with him. Say, Jack, I just thought of something. Eddie's got a house in Palm Springs. Maybe he'll rent your room. What do you mean, rent me a room? He's a friend of mine. He'll probably give it to me for nothing. Let's sit with him. Hello, Eddie. How are you? Well, Jack, Mary, sit down. Sit down. <laughs> Say, uh, I haven't seen you in a long time, Jack. You look marvelous. Well, thanks, Eddie, but I have been a little sick, you know. Sick or not, I hope I look as good as you do when I'm your age. <laughs> you did. Well, how's the family, Eddie? How's Ida and the boys? <laughs> the boys? Yeah, you're writers. Oh, poo! <laughs> For a minute, you scared me. I haven't been home all week, you know. You haven't? No, but I'm leaving for Los Angeles tonight. Eddie, you're going back to Los Angeles? Gee, I'm starved, Jack. I'm going to order something. Go ahead, Mary. Incidentally, the peanut butter sandwiches here are... <laughs> Are delicious. Incidentally, I'm ordering the roast beef. Incidentally, the roast beef costs a dollar seventy-five. Incidentally, everybody's looking at us. Shut up. All right, Mary, you can have the roast beef. But if I want to kiss later, don't ask what for. <laughs> oh, brother, what you have to go through to keep from starving. Say, I'm kind of hungry myself. What are you having, Eddie? It looks good. Chicken soup with egg noodles. Chicken soup with egg noodles? I think I'll have some of that. Okay, I'll have the way to bring you a spoon. No, no. <laughs> no, no, Eddie. Eddie, I'll order some. You know, a bowl for myself. They haven't got it today. I brought this from home. <laughs> oh, spoon, waiter. Spoon, spoon. You don't have to throw it. And waiter, bring me an order of roast beef. At last, a sale in this booth. I can't believe it. <laughs> Fresh guy. 
Gee, this soup looks good, Eddie. Yeah, let's start. Ready? Scoop. You know, Eddie, I'm sure glad I... Boy, this soup is hot. You know, Eddie, I'm sure glad I... Eddie, would you mind eating with your left hand and putting your right arm around my shoulder? I'm too far from the bowl. Look, Jack. Jack, why don't you put your right hand through my left sleeve then we can both dip at the same time? No, then we'd have to cut a hole in your coat. That won't work. Why don't you put the bowl on my head and eat piggyback? You go and get that roast beef. I think we're all right now, Eddie. Let's go. Okay, ready? Scoop. As I was saying, Eddie, I'm sure glad I bumped into... Jack, would you mind breaking a cracker and putting it into the soup? But I can't stand crackers in my soup. Well, break one in any way and float it over to my side. (laughs) Okay. There. Anyway, Eddie, I'm sure glad I... You see? You see? The crackers aren't floating. They're all on my side. Well, tip the bowl a little. Tip the bowl a little. Oh, yeah. C-A-T. Get ready, Eddie. (laughs) Forward, soup. Say, Mary, while you're waiting, why don't you get a spoon and join us? Don't bring guests. It's crowded enough. (laughs) Well, I've had enough anyway. Here's your roast beef. Thank you. You want three forks with it, or are the boys sitting this one out? Don't be so smart. Now, Eddie, as I was saying, I'm sure glad I bumped into you. You see, I'm going to stay in Palm Springs for a while, and I was wondering if you knew of any place where I could live. Uh, When did you say you were going back, Eddie? Tonight. Oh, no. Well, I was just wondering if you knew of any place where I could live from tonight on. Well, Jack, I can't think of any place for rent at the moment, but say... I'll tell you what. What, what? Tell me what. What, what? What, what, what? No, no, I don't think you'd like it. Yes, I would. Yes, I would. Tell me, tell me. What, what, what are you going to say, Eddie? What? Well, I happen to have a little house down here, Eddie. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. So why don't you stay there? Well, that's darn nice, Eddie. What would you charge me for? Well, Jack, we're friends. We've known each other for years. Take the house for nothing. No, no, Eddie. Now, wait. Friendship is friendship, but I don't want to take advantage of it. Now, I insist on paying you for the house. Oh, take it for nothing, please. I'll feel better. But, Eddie, I'll feel much better if you charge me something for it. A little something. No, no. Yes, yes, yes. Now, how much do you want for one week? Three hundred dollars. Three... Three hundred dollars? Isn't that a big jump from nothing? Uh, waiter, bring me some more roast beef. We'll be here a long time. Mary, look, Eddie, $300 is a lot of money. But, Jack, look what you're getting. A tennis court. I don't play tennis. A swimming pool. Look, I can't swim. And a beautiful kitchen. I know you make cookies. <laughs> Eddie, I still think $300 is a little high. All right, you can have the house for $250. How's that? Look, Eddie, give me the house for nothing. You'll feel better, like you said. <laughs> All right, Jack, I'll give you the house for nothing, but do me one favor. What? There are plenty of hotels in Palm Springs. Don't start a new one, huh? <laughs> Don't worry, I won't. Thanks, Eddie. But, but just a minute, Jack. Before I give you the key, I think I'd better call Ida and see if it's okay. All right, Eddie, do it now. I'll be back in a minute. Hey, Mary, this is really a break, isn't it? I never dreamed I'd get Candor's house for nothing. See, I can give one room to Don, one to Phil, one room to you... Wait a minute, Ida. Don't hang up. But Ida. But Ida. Ida, I couldn't turn him down. He's an old friend. He's an old what? (laughs) But Ida, Ida, how would you feel if I was in his position? How much can he make selling cigarettes? (laughs) But Ida, now I... Now look, Ida, I'm the boss. I'm not going to argue with you any longer. I promised Jack Benny you could have the house and you're going to get it. Goodbye. Well, Jack, it's all settled. And are you in luck? To anybody else, the house would be $300. And to me, it's for nothing? $300. Who do you think you are? (laughs) Oh, well, the soup didn't cost me anything. Come on, Mary, let's go. (laughs) 
She married was certainly nice of Eddie Cantor to let me have his house. It sure was. You know, he was only kidding. He gave it to me for nothing. And just think, it has four bedrooms. Yeah, you'll make a fortune. <laughs> Mary, I'm not going to charge my friends. It's my fault that everybody can't stand me. Good night, folks. <laughs> California, the Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, may I recite a little poem? Last Thursday was St. Valentine's Day, the day when love is in bloom. It's also Jack Benny's birthday. Nobody leave this room. (laughs) Hello, folks. Thank you. And, Don, let me tell you something. I'm very proud of the fact that I was born in February, the same month as George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Just think, Washington, Lincoln, and Benny. The first big three. (laughs) George, Abe, and Jack. And, you know, Don, it was just a stroke of luck that I arrived in February. I was supposed to be born in March. In March? Well, then how come you were born in February? Well, the stork was flying south for the winter, and he didn't want to come back just for me. (laughs) It's a long trip, you know. Well, anyway, Jack, congratulations on passing another milestone. Thank you. Oh, uh, by the way, uh, how old are you now? Thirty-seven. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Thirty-seven? Why, Jack, you said you were thirty-seven last year. And now, ladies and, and gentlemen... And the year before. And now, ladies and gentlemen... And the year before that, you said you were thirty-seven. Don, when you're happy with something, why leave it? <laughs> Anyway, a lot you care. You didn't even come to my birthday party. Well, I'm very sorry, Jack. I got your invitation, but I had to go back to Los Angeles. Oh. And, Jack, there was one thing about the invitation I didn't quite understand. What was that, Don? Well, it said, uh, you are cordially invited to attend my birthday party on Thursday, 15, 34, 11. What do those numbers mean? They're the size of my shirts, underwear, and socks. (laughs) I knew... I knew you'd want to bring something. <laughs> I used to put RSVP, and what did I get? Nothing. <laughs> so from now on, I'm not taking Hello, any... Hello, Jack. How are you, Don? Oh, hello, hello, Mary. Mary. Hello. <laughs> Say, Mary, uh, Don and I were just talking about my birthday party. We had a lot of fun, didn't we? Yeah, you should have been there, Don. We played charades and post office and spin the bottle. Yeah. And then we played blind man's buff. <laughs> And you should have seen Jack when he was it. Oh, uh, what'd he do, Mary? Tie a handkerchief around his eyes? No, he just turned out the lights. He figured he'd have fun and save money at the same time. <laughs> same time. Your sister Babe would have fit in blind man's box. <laughs> <laughs> then about 11 o'clock, we all got hungry, so Rochester brought in Jack's birthday cake. Oh, birthday cake, huh? How'd it taste? I don't know. By the time we took all the candles off it, I wasn't hungry anymore. <laughs> Mary, just be glad that I sent you an invitation to my party, that's all. Say, Jack, I meant to ask you about that invitation. It said, uh, you are cordially invited to attend my birthday party on Thursday. S.O.S. What did S.O.S. mean? Short on socks. (laughs) I always have to remind you. Hmm. I always have to remind... Oh, for heaven's sake, that's the cue for Phil Harris. He's not even here yet. Well, maybe he's at the Lone Palm getting potted. (laughs) I don't care. I don't care where he is. We've got to get on with the show. Mary, you take his lines. Oh, Jack, I can't read Phil's lines. Mary, we can't hold up the show. Now, go ahead and read Phil's part. I'll give you the cue again. Short on socks. Okay, folks, here's your favorite pixie. Harris is here, and he's right from Dixie. Appreciate me. Appreciate me. (laughs) Phil, I wish you'd stop coming in here with those corny entrances. And another thing... Hey, Jackson, Jackson, I got a joke that'll murder you. Ask me what the wallpaper said to the wall. Phil. Go ahead, ask. All right, Phil. What does the wallpaper say to the wall? You may be plastered, but I'll stick to you anyway. Ha, ha, ha! Oh, Harris, you're like a strong theater seat. You never let the audience down. Love it, love it, love it! <laughs> now, Phil, the next time... Ladies you... and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who tuned in late, the part of Phil Harris is being played by Mary Livingston. <laughs> Well, it's no use, Mary. Even you can't say those kind of jokes. Let's have a song from Larry Stevens while we're waiting for Phil. 
Oh, Larry. Here I am, Mr. Benny. <laughs> Say, Mr. Benny, I want to thank you for inviting me to your party. I sure had a good time. At my party? Larry, I didn't see you there. When would you come in? When you were playing blind man's buff. Oh, oh, did I say hello to you? No, but you kissed me twice. <laughs> oh. Well, kid, when you get a little older and grow a beard, I won't make that mistake. Now, <laughs> now let's have a song, Larry. Okay. By the way, Mr. Benny, there was one thing I didn't understand about that invitation you sent me. What was that, kid? Well, it said you are cordially invited to attend my birthday party on Thursday. G-T-D-T-K-W-I-N. What does that mean? Go to Desmond's. They know what I need. <laughs> Thing, kid. And thanks for the bicycle clip. It was just my size, by the way. Thank you very, very much. That, um, that was Larry Stevens singing Let It Snow. The title is really Let It Snow, Let It Snow. You're supposed to say it twice. But we have a very long show, and if we take up too much time, the tobacco auctioneer at the end of the program will have to hurry, and you won't be able to understand a thing he said. <laughs> So in view of the fact that we're trying to save time, I had to change the title of Larry's song from Let It Snow, Let It Snow to Just Let It Snow. <laughs> and uh, now, folks... That line was originally ladies and gentlemen, but the genius cut it down to folks. Yes, yes. We save wherever we can. And that's why I changed the title of Larry's song... <laughs> okay, from... folks, here's your favorite pixie. Harris is here, and he's right from Dixie. <laughs> appreciate me, appreciate me. Yes. Well, we, we couldn't wait for you any longer, so Mary did your routine. Now, go sit down. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Jackson. I got a joke that'll murder you. Ask me what the wallpaper said to the wall. Phil, Mary did that joke. I don't care who did it. Go on, ask me what the wallpaper <laughs> said to the wall. <laughs> All right, Phil, we'll do it again. What did the wallpaper say to the wall? You might be a little cracked, but I got designs on you. <laughs> They ought to put a slot in your head because your brains are like money in the bank. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Yes. What kind of language is that? Just... How do you like that? Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who tuned in late, aren't you glad you're you? <laughs> Phil, Phil, you're supposed to do what we rehearse and not bring in any new stuff. I got designs on you. Where'd you get that joke? Well, I hired myself a writer, Jackson. I found him right here in Palm Springs. A writer? Yeah, he lives right over here on the Indian Reservation. Phil, I know Palm Springs is crowded, but why is he living on... No, I can't ask him. <laughs> Mary, Mary, you do it. Okay, Phil. Phil, I know Palm Springs is crowded, but why is he living on an Indian Reservation? Because he's an Indian. <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Phil, I don't know I don't know where you find him, but I never heard of an Indian writer. Well, I, I think you're wrong, Jack. Some Indians are very good writers. And now, folks... Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of you Indians who tuned in late, my face is red, too. <laughs> this is the craziest program we've done yet. What are we aiming at? 430. <laughs> Say... 7.30 in the east, you know? Say, hey, Jackson, we better start getting sharper. We'll hear about it at 5.30. You know, that's when Fred Allen comes on. Phil, when you mention Fred Allen on this program, you must be closer to retirement than I think you are. <laughs> I heard his program last week. While he was telling a joke, a long word got stuck in his nose sideways, and he held up the show for five minutes. <laughs> Don't tell me about Allen. Oh, Jack, you're just mad because his picture is better than yours. Mary, that's no comparison. Everybody's picture is better than mine. <laughs> now, let's forget about that ill wind from Allen's Allen. Sign for a band number. Go ahead, Phil. Okay, boys, filibuster. That, uh, that was Sweetheart, played by Phil Harris and his sweetest music, this side of Roger Stable's orchestra. <laughs> and that's a, uh... For the benefit of those horses who tuned in late, Roger Stable is a stable owned by Rogers. <laughs> Roger. I mean, thank you. Now, come on. Come on, kids. Let's keep the show moving. Well, what's the hurry, Jackson? Well, uh, I'm having some important people over for dinner tonight, and I don't want to be late. See, Rochester's calling for me. 
By the way, Mary, remind me to pick up some salami on the way home, will you? <laughs> okay. Oh, Jack, I meant to ask you about Rochester. Is it true that he was lost for two days out on the ocean? Yes. Uh, yeah, he was out in a boat near Catalina. Yeah, I read about it, Jackson. I heard it on the radio, too. Yeah. Funny thing, I, I didn't know anything about it until it was all over. You didn't? No. When I found out about it last Wednesday, I was home taking my violin lesson. You know, I still have my music teacher, Professor LeBlanc. Anyway, here's what happened. Monsieur Benny, once more you have made this same mistake. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, Professor LeBlanc. Shall I do it again? Yes. And this time, please, take off your gloves. <laughs> well, the strings are cold. <laughs> All right. Knock. No, no, mon de conscience sacre bleu, Monsieur Benny. Please tell me something. How long have you been playing the violin? Well, ever since I can remember, I was a child prodigy. I do not believe it. That I was a prodigy? No, that you were a child. <laughs> and now, Monsieur Benny, I guess the hour is up. No, no, it isn't, Professor. When we started the lesson, I set the alarm clock. It'll ring when the hour is up. All right. For this, for this, I left Lockheed. <laughs> Now, one and two and three and four and... Well, how do you like that? He didn't even wait for me to pay him. Oh, well. I wonder if I should keep practicing. No, no, I can't stand it anymore. Oh, gee, I wish I hadn't told Rochester he could have a couple of days off. He does everything for me. So tired of sleeping with my clothes on. <laughs> well, I guess I'll turn on the radio. I'm the Whistler. I walk by night. <laughs> Gee, that Whistler scares me. I've got such a nice painting of his mother. <laughs> I'll try and get something else. Ladies and gentlemen, are you nearsighted? When you're having breakfast, do you get too close to your hotcakes? Do you get molasses on your glasses? Do you suffer from middle age spread? Do your hips try to hurdle your girdle? <laughs> if you suffer from these or any other ailments, why not try sympathy soothing, sir? Remember, sympathy spelled backwards is your tapamus. Y H T A P M Y S. He must have a new quartet there. <laughs> and now, folks, here is our Utapamus news reporter with a special item. Ladies and gentlemen, Rochester Van Jones, who has been adrift in the Pacific Ocean for the last two days, has been found by the Coast Guard and towed into port. What? Rochester is the butler of that famous comedian, Jack Bentley. That's Benny. <laughs> Our quartet will now sing their version of that new song hit, Yes, We Have No Bananas, Butter, or Sugar. I don't want to hear that. Oh, my goodness, Rochester adrift in the Pacific. I didn't even know he was on a boat. Well, thank heaven he's safe. When he gets home, I'm going to... Maybe that's him. Hello? Long distance call for Jack Bentley. That's Benny. <laughs> I'll take it. Very well. Hello? Hello? Hello, is this Rochester? You were expecting maybe ship work, Kelly? <laughs> Rochester, I just heard about you being in the ocean for two days. How are you? Salty. 
I know, I know, but tell me what happened. Well, boss, me and my friend Sam were about 20 miles off Catalina when we developed motor trouble. And you know I can't swim. Uh Uh-huh. Then suddenly a big wave swept me overboard and I landed right next to a vicious-looking shark. So I got back to the boat fast. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You just said you couldn't swim. I didn't think I could run on water either, but I did. (laughs) Well, well, what happened then? Well, when we weren't rescued after the first day, we realized we were in a tough spot. So we started sending out messages in bottles. What did the messages say? Send more bottles. <laughs> Rochester, I hope you weren't drinking out there. Oh, no, boss. No, sir. But after the second day, we sure got hungry. And fortunately, a bird landed on back of the boat. A bird? Good. So I picked up my rifle, took aim, and I... Rifle? Rochester, you wouldn't shoot a poor little bird. No, I just wanted to frighten her enough to lay an egg. Did you frighten her? Did I? She laid two eggs, three strips of bacon. Rochester, don't be ridiculous. A bird can't lay bacon. Boss, when you got a gun in your face, you find out you got talent you never knew you had. Never mind that. Now, tell me, how did you get back to shore? Well, the Coast Guard finally found us and towed us into the harbor. Well, I'm glad it came out all right. It certainly was an unusual experience. It sure was. (laughs) Rochester, what are you laughing at? It's the first time I ever lost a weekend on water. (laughs) My fault. Anyway, Rochester, I'm glad you're safe. And hurry out here to Palm Springs. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well done. There you are. That's how I found out about Rochester. Jack, another program's over. Yep, another program and another birthday. Just think, Mary, next year at this time, I'll be 39. 39? Jack, you said this year you were 37. Oh, yes, yes, I'll be 38. I gotta watch that. (laughs) Good night, Jack. the Plaza Theater in Palm Springs, the Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to Jack Benny's house here in Palm Springs. It's an hour before showtime and Jack is taking a nap. Rochester is going quietly about his duties. I'm always chasing rainbows, watching clouds drifting by. My schemes are just like all my dreams, ending in the sky. Some fellows seem to have the good things, but all I do is sit and pine. Some fellows make a seven sometimes, but I can't even throw a nine. Uh, Rochester? I'm always chasing rainbows! Rochester! (laughs) Well, boss, I see you got your little blue eyes open. I hope my singing didn't wake you up. Yes, it did, Rochester, but I just had the most wonderful dream. Really? You know, I dreamt I was listening to Fred Allen's program. He went down to Allen's Alley, knocked on all the doors, and there was nobody home. What a lull. (laughs) And then I dreamt his program was so bad, his sponsor came in and threw him off the air. (laughs) Allen couldn't get another job, and he sank lower and lower. And then I dreamt he became a bum on Broadway, mooching nickels and dimes for something to eat. (laughs) What are you laughing at? If you'd have slept about five minutes longer, you'd have to send him flowers. Yeah. Anyway, it was a wonderful dream. I wonder what he dreams about me. 
He wouldn't waste his time on you, boss. He's still young enough to dream about the opposite sex. <laughs> Oh, no, he isn't it. Say, Rochester, what time is it? 3.25. Oh, my goodness, I told Miss Livingston to drop by here at 3.30. I better hurry. Uh, what kind of show are you going to do today, boss? Oh, just something informal, nothing special. Probably ad-lib a lot. You know. Oh, Jack, Jack, come on. We'll be late for the show. Right with you, Mary. See you after the broadcast, Rochester. Goodbye. Bye. Hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Gee, you look nice. Say, where were you last night? Why, Jack, I was at the barn dance at Roger's Stables with... Oh, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, come on, Mary. Who are you dancing with? No, I'm not going to tell you. Come on, Mary. Don't keep seeking to me. Who are you dancing with? You, you dope, and you fell asleep. <laughs> huh? Oh, yes, that's right. I had Ovaltine for dinner. <laughs> See, Mary, isn't Palm Springs a nice little town? It's all right, I guess. Yeah, look at that cute date shop. You know, this desert is famous for dates. I know, I know. And look at this place next to it. Florist and date shop. Look. Yeah. Gee, it's such a cute town. Pardon me, Miss Livingston. May I have your autograph? Why, certainly. Gee, thank you. <laughs> oh, look, Mary. Look, look at that little place across the street. Cleaners, dyers, and date shop. I sent my suit there, and it came back so sticky. Before they press it, they put samples in your pockets. <laughs> but this is the cutest little town, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, Miss Livingston, would you give me your autograph, please? Well, surely. Here you are, honey. Thank you. Hmm. Hey, Mary. Mary, look, here's the place where I bought my spurs. Where? Right here. Boot, saddles, harness, date shop. <laughs> You know, Mary, there's something about this town that's so relaxing and restful. No wonder so many people come here. Uh-huh. Miss Livingston? Yes? Miss Livingston, would you give me your autograph, please? Oh, I'll be glad to. Here you are. Thank you very much. You know, Jack, this is a cute little town. What's cute about it? <laughs> you know, Mary, you turned out to be the biggest ham I ever saw. Signing... <laughs> Mary, we haven't time to fool around. Give me my two hot dogs, please. Here you are. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Pickle in the middle and the mustard on top, just the way you like them. <laughs> well, come on, Mary. Here's the stage. We better get on. <laughs> oh, Harris, you're so pretty. It's too bad you're not two-faced. <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mary, like we must this... be late. Hey, Phil! What? Wow, Jackson, hold it. I'm just going into a band number. Gee, my watch must be wrong. Yeah, you never should have bought it at that date shop. <laughs> I guess you're right. Go ahead, Phil. Go ahead. Thank you. That was Come to Baby Do, played by Phil Harris and his melancholy music makers. <laughs> melancholy meaning half of them have heads like melons, <laughs> and the other half look like collies. <laughs> Except Frankie, the guitar player. He looks a little like a St. Bernard there. <laughs> Wait a minute, Jackson. Frankie may be shaggy, but he don't look like no St. Bernard. Then why has he got a keg of brandy around his neck? <laughs> because when he comes to an eight-bar rest, he ain't gonna just sit there doing nothing. <laughs> oh. Well, can't he just sit there and listen to the music? That's what drove him to drink. Oh, I know. <laughs> what a band. Well, let's get on with the show now that I'm here. Oh, hello, Don. Where have you been? Well, I just stepped out to get a package of Luckies. A package of Luckies? Where'd you get them? In the lobby, out of that cigarette and date machine. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, Don, I wouldn't eat any of those dates if I were you. They're fattening, you know, and you're not exactly Tom Thumb, you know. <laughs> well, I know, Jack, but since I've been down here in Palm Springs, I don't look so big. That's only because they have so many mountains here. <laughs> Take my word for it, you are, shall we say, a trifle obese? Yes, we'll say it. Obese. I don't know, Jackson. There are plenty of guys that are obeser than Don. <laughs> obeser? Phil, that word isn't even in Webster's Dictionary. How do you like that? I'm smarter than Webster. 
Well, don't let Webster find it out. He'd probably be upset. Now, let's get out. Come in. Yes? Mr. Benny, my name is Streeby. I'm the manager of this theater and date shop. <laughs> oh. Oh, hello, Mr. Streeby. Hello. Uh, step right. This is the real manager. Step right up the microphone, Mr. Streeby. Don't be nervous. A little closer, you know. After all, this is your theater, you know. You, you didn't have to pay to get in, you know. I had to rent the joint. I mean, <laughs> Mr. Streeby, I'm glad you dropped in. I've been anxious to find out if you ran my picture here. Yes, we did, Mr. Benny, uh, quite recently. Good, good. No, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what do you mean? Well, we ran your picture Saturday and Sunday, and it turned out to be a double feature. Double feature? Yes, the horn blows at midnight on the screen, and lost weekend at the box office. <laughs> I can't understand why the picture didn't do well, you know? Neither can I. You know, this isn't like the East. When business is bad, we can't blame it on the weather. Hmm. <laughs> Come to think of it, that picture did do better in the cooler climates. Yeah, Warner Brothers got a letter from three Eskimos saying it was the best film they ever ate. <laughs> you said it. Well, I'll be right along now. I just dropped in to see if there was anything you need. Nothing at all, but thanks very much. Goodbye, Mrs. Streeby. Oh, say, Mr. Benny. How do you like that? A guy gets a laugh, he can't get rid of him. <laughs> now, now what? Mr. Benny, I don't want to get personal, but I always thought you were, wore a toupee. Well, this is Palm Springs. Everybody goes around with the top down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Goodbye, Mr. Streeby. Uh, goodbye. Oh, Mr. Benny. Never mind. Goodbye. <laughs> Everybody comes in here with jokes, no dates. Can't understand why he was so nervous at the microphone. I was right up here with him. Yeah, but after the broadcast, you leave town. He has to stay here. I suppose so. Well, it's time for a song. Where's Larry? Here I am, Mr. Benny. Uh, what are you going to sing tonight, kid? A brand new novelty song called Pickle in the Middle. Pickle in the Middle? <laughs> Say, isn't that what the, what the little hot dog man sings? Yes. Carl Sigman and John Tackerberry wrote a song around it. Tackerberry. John... Tackerberry. I've heard that name somewhere before. He's one of your writers. Oh, yes, yes. He's the one with the lowest forehead. His nose makes a natural part in his hair. Let's hear the song, Larry. Come on, let's hear it. Thank you. That was Pickle in the Middle, sung by Larry Stevens with the mustard on top. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce a guest, rather unusual to radio. The gentleman I'm about to present is a writer at Paramount Studios. He is also a noted critic and the author of articles which appear in the country's leading magazines. Also the author of Seven Lively Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Gilbert Seldy. Uh, Mr. Seldes, I'm very, very happy to have you on my program. Thank you, Mr. Benny. Can I ask you a question? Why, certainly. Go right ahead. Just why did you invite me to come over here today? What's the purpose of my appearance? Mr. Seldes, did you or did you not write an article that appears in the March issue of Esquire magazine? Mr. Benny, I write an article in every issue of Esquire. Answer yes or no. <laughs> yes. Now, in this article, Mr. Seldes, did you or did you not state that radio comedy today is based primarily on sarcastic humor and insulting jokes. I did. Hmm. <laughs> he admits it yet. In that article, Mr. Seldes, you said that comedians have been insulting each other so much that radio has become a source of boredom. That is correct. And to prove my point, Mr. Benny, take your program today. You insulted Phil Harris's orchestra... Miss Livingston ridiculed your dancing, and even the theater manager who came in unprepared had to make a slurring remark about your toupee. Yes, yes, he even panned my picture. Well, that he couldn't help. <laughs> I see. 
Then, uh, Mr. Seldes, uh, what you meant by your article in Esquire is that you would like to hear a comedy program with a delicate neighborly motif. Something sweet and homey. Sort of a mock person with a band. <laughs> is that... Is that what you meant? Well, I was only trying... I to... know what you were trying to do, Mr. Seldes. And the Hughes program would sound the way you would like to hear it. Sit down, Mr. Seldes. Thank you. <laughs> Jack, why make such an issue of it? Because I'm here to defend radio. Radio to me is bread and butter in a swimming pool. All right, kids, let's do a nice, sweet program like Mr. Seldes prefers. Phil, is the harpist ready? Yeah, Jackson, the dame just came in. <laughs> All right, now we'll take it right from the very beginning. Ready, Don? Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lucky Strike program. And now, dear listeners, from Palm Springs, one of the most beloved spots in the sunny state of California... We bring you your genial Sunday night host, Jack Life Can Be Beautiful, Benny. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. May I come into your home for just a short half hour? Hmm? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Well, Don, hasn't our stay in Palm Springs been delightful? Oh, it certainly has, Jack. And, Don, I hope you won't mind commenting, but uh, I just can't get over how thin you are. You're so unobese. <laughs> really? Well, Jack, I may be less obeser, but I wish I had all your hair. Well, you know how it is, Don. We just can't have everything. Generally. <laughs> <laughs> well, look who's here. Mary Livingston. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mary. <laughs> yes. Mary is a grand old name, and you're a grand little girl. How are you, sweetheart? Oh, I'm just ginger peachy with a mustard on top. <laughs> you always are. And doll face. Yes. <laughs> I'll never, never be able to thank you for the beautiful necklace you gave me. Oh, it was nothing. Nothing? Jack, it's just like you to be so modest. What kind of a necklace did he give you, Mary? A string of 150 perfectly matched dates. <laughs> well? And imported from Anaheim. Well, I always get the best. Now, you know, I strung them myself on one of my violin strings. Oh, Snoogie, you shouldn't have taken this. <laughs> <laughs> now you won't be able to play it. Well? Just a minute, Mr. Benny. I didn't mean... Sit down, to... Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> You haven't seen anything yet. Wait till Phil Harris comes in with a glass of milk. <laughs> ah, here comes Philip now. <laughs> Phil, aren't you a little late? Yes, Jason, and I'm frightfully sorry. <laughs> But on the way down here, I passed the most tempting little fruit juice stand, and I just couldn't resist having a gloss of that sun-kissed orange juice. Orange of my fill? I thought you drank milk. Only at parties to be sociable, Jason. <laughs> oh. You can't be an old deadhead, you know. Of course not. Say, Phil, we've had so many requests. Yes, from our listeners, for you to sing a number on the program. How about doing one now? All right, I'll sing two courses of That's What I Adore About Dixie. <laughs> oh, that'll be just two, two. Uh, two, two, what's that? That's four, the hard way. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Phil. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Benner. Evidently, you didn't understand the point of my Mr. article. Mr. Selby, you brought it on yourself. Now, sit down. <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, yes. Say, Phil, before you do your number, I meant to ask you, uh, wasn't your first violinist with the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra? Yes, for seven consecutive, and I might add, lucrative years. <laughs> I thought so. And the gentleman there on the end, wasn't he associated with the Boston Symphony? Yes, for three seasons he played obese. That's all ball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Thanks, Webster. You're welcome, Phil. As a matter of fact, all your boys are symphony men, aren't they? Yes. And how come they all look like dogs? <laughs> Mr. Sully's, apparently you haven't read your article in Esquire. And now, uh... <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Oh, fudge, there's the phone. Hello? Hello, Mr. Penny, this is Rochester. Oh, yes, yes, Rochester. Why are you calling? Something's gone wrong with the radio. What do you mean? Don Wilson got thin, you got hair, Mr. Harris drinks milk, and Mary's a grand old name. <laughs> oh, oh, well, Rochester, we're trying a new formula where everything is quiet and sweet. Quiet and sweet? Yes. Well, boss, you better get loud and funny. Your swimming pool ain't paid for you. <laughs> yes, I guess you're right, Rochester. Goodbye. Goodbye. The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, our show is still in Palm Springs, so let's go out to Jack Benny's house, where we find Jack relaxing and reading the local newspaper. Hmm, look at all these want ads. Here's one from Bullock's store. Wanted floor walker. Must have own carnation. <laughs> hmm. Wanted fry cook. Apply Chi Chi restaurant. Wanted stable boy. Had better have own carnation. <laughs> Wanted gardener's helper at Deepwell Ranch. Apply between two and... Oh, this is silly. I'm sure my sponsor will pick up my option. <laughs> but just in case he doesn't. Well, they've got a gossip column here, too. Hmm. Tyrone Power, who was visiting here last week... Imagine that. <laughs> Last night, Pauline Betts, famous tennis player. <laughs> All these columnists sure get around. Well, here's something about me. Jack Benny. I did not. <laughs> Imagine saying I went to the post office wearing a bare midriff. <laughs> Just happened that the laundry shrunk my shirt. Well, that finished the newspaper. Rochester, hand me those pamphlets I got from the Palm Springs Chamber of Commerce. Here you are, boss. Thanks. Hmm, listen to this. Palm Springs, the jewel of the desert, where the warm, radiant sun pours its golden treasure down on the happy and carefree inhabitants. Palm Springs, where the majestic peaks of the San Jacinto Mountains cast their spell of beauty for all to enjoy. Do you hear that, Rochester? Uh -huh. And just think, Mother Nature gives us all these things free. Yeah, it's a shame Mother ain't running the hotels, too. <laughs> well, Mom's got enough to do. But I like Palm Springs. In fact, I'm thinking of buying a house here. I even asked a real estate man to come over this afternoon. But, boss, property is so expensive down here. I know it is, but if I can find just what I want, I'm willing to go up to $1,500. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> what are you laughing at? $1,500 ain't peanuts. I know, but down here, that's all it'll buy. <laughs> oh, Rochester. Rossi, you're exaggerating. No, I ain't, boss. You know that little house on the corner with the white fence around it? Uh-huh. That just sold for $80,000 and two pounds of butter. <laughs> well, maybe it had it. There's the door. I'll get it. Are you Jack Benny? Yes. Well, I'm Mr. Fulton, the real estate man. Oh, yes, yes. Step right in. Rochester, take his hat, coat, and empty the sand out of his shoes. <laughs> now, Mr. Benny, just what type of house do you have in mind? Spanish, colonial, or French provincial? 
Well, Mr. Fulton, I think a home should suit the individual. Uh, what kind of a house would fit me? Uh, how about early American? <laughs> no, no, I don't think I'd like early American. How about sold American? Rochester. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Fulton, I don't know what to do. Did you bring your pictures with you? Yes, I did. Now, here's what it'd be when I graduated from... I college. mean your house. <laughs> pictures of your houses. Oh, yes, yes, I always make that mistake. I guess it's because I have a head with seven gables. Oh. And Garson's got every one of them. <laughs> Now, look, Mr. Fulton, let's get down to business. Show me some pictures of what you have to offer. Gladly. Now, here we are. Here's a house that ought to interest you, and the price is $40,000. $40,000 for a house? That's a lot of money. What about the ceiling? And with the ceiling, it'll be $60,000. <laughs> look, at that, that's not what I mean. Anyway, it's much too expensive. Oh, not for this house. It has a very novel innovation. A 300-foot spiral banister. You mean a spiral staircase, don't you? No, no, a spiral banister. That's for people who don't drink but want to know how it feels. <laughs> I don't think I'd like that. That banister could save me a fortune. Rochester, please. Show me something else, Mr. Fulton. Have you got a house with a swimming pool? No, but that's no problem. I can build you a tile pool for only $10,000. No, no, I don't want to go that high. Well, I can build you a cement pool for only $2,500. No, no, that's still too high for a swimming pool. Uh, why don't you just dig a hole and hire a tribe of Indians to do a rain dance? <laughs> What's so cheap about that? They're organized, you know. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Fulton, I don't think you have the kind of a house I want. Well, let me show you one more. Here's a beautiful house, and it's only $70,000. Well, it's a lovely place, but $75,000 70, is too much. Uh, anyway, Mr. Fulton, thanks very much for dropping in. Maybe we can talk about it some other time. All right. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Fulton. Yes? Uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> What's, the... What's that yellow stuff running out of your pocket? Oh, my goodness, it's butter. I just sold the house on the corner. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I heard about it. Goodbye, Mr. Fulton. Goodbye. Well, Rochester, I better get down to the Plaza Theater. The broadcast will be on in a few minutes. Say, that reminds me, boss. The manager of the theater called up yesterday. What about? Well, he said according to the rental contract, when you finish your program, you're supposed to leave and not hang around and watch the picture. <laughs> What's he complaining about? I stand up, don't I? Well, I got to get to the theater. Shall I drive you, boss? No, the wind will take me over today. <laughs> Go so on, Rochester. Goodbye. Oh, played by Klondike Harris and his sweetest music, This Side of the Yukon. And you can have it. <laughs> I sat up all night writing that joke. I'll bet you hated yourself in the morning. Not any more than usual. Say, Phil, Larry Stevens sang that number two weeks ago. How come you repeated it as a band number? Why don't you tend to your comedy and keep your nose out of my business? <laughs> well, it happens to be my business, too. After all, who's the star of this show? I don't know, but when I see my paycheck every week, I know it ain't me. <laughs> oh, stop complaining. You're getting a good salary. What are you talking about? Alice gets more than I do for an autograph. <laughs> And the moral of the story is learn to write. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen... Hey, Jack, we had to start the show without you. Where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry I was late, Dom. You see, I'm thinking of buying a house here, and I was detained by a real estate man. Oh, Jack, are you thinking of moving to Palm Springs? Well, I was toying with the idea, Don. You know, I like it here. I've been having so much fun horseback riding, playing golf every day. I played golf this morning, didn't I, Mary? Uh-huh. You know, Don, they got the nicest little nine-hole cords here. You should have seen me this morning on that fourth hole. I put down my ball, picked up my club, and he then... He missed it once, he missed it twice, he missed it once again. It's been a long... Mary! <laughs> Certainly I missed it. You know, it's hard to hit a ball when it's not teed up properly. Well, you wouldn't have that trouble if you buy some tees. Mary, you mean to say that Jack doesn't use tees when he plays golf? 
No, he waits for a gopher to stick his head out of a hole, and then he puts the ball on his nose. <laughs> oh, Mary, I play a good game of golf, and you know it. Oh, sure. Tell him what happened on the fifth hole. Nothing happened. I did exactly what my golf teacher told me. I placed the ball in line with my left foot, brought the club over my right shoulder, and wham! He broke his toe. <laughs> I did not. I killed the gopher. Now, how it four. If he doesn't know the rules, let him keep off the court. <laughs> Anyway, I play a better game of golf than anybody in this gang. I beat Phil the other day. Sure you beat me. Every time you took a nine on a hole, you turned the scorecard upside down before you rode it in. Well, I could have beat you without that if I hadn't knocked one ball out of bounds. Yeah, and what about that bad slice you made on your first drive? Oh, that wasn't such a bad slice. It wasn't, huh? The ball went 50 yards, made a U-turn, came back and hit you in the stomach. Mary. Then you got so mad you were going to break your club against a tree. Well, what stopped him? When he drew his club back, he saw the price tag on the bottom, so he put it back in his bag. <laughs> you can make up more things. I still say I play a better... G- I'll get it. Hello? Say, boss, Mr. Fulton, the real estate man, came back and said they found a few termites in the house, so you can have it for 65000 Termites, huh? Well, Rock says you tell Mr. Fulton that I'm not paying any $65,000 for a house. If he hasn't guessed that by now, he's been out in the sun too long. <laughs> I don't care where he's been. I'm not spending that kind of dough. Would you pay $65,000 for a house in Palm Springs? I wouldn't pay $65,000 for a cabin in the sky. <laughs> well, tell the man. Tell the man. I did. I did. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, the kids, it looks like I'm not going to buy a house here. Anyway, let's get on with the show, because tonight we're going to do a very important sketch. And I want to start casting it immediately. Say, Jackson, I thought you were going to do a sketch next week. We are, Phil. We're going to do a sketch next week, too. And you'll never guess in a million years who our guest star is going to be. Ray Milan. There's no use trying. You'll... Yes, that's who it is, Ray <laughs> Milan. The star of Lost Weekend. And to make him feel at ease, we're having a brass rail put around the microphone. <laughs> Anyway, that's next week. Ray Milland. Gee, I think he's a wonderful actor. I can drink him under the table. <laughs> Phil, with him, it's bread and butter. With you, it's tomato juice and black coffee. <laughs> now, let's get on with the sketch we're going to do tonight. It's a murder mystery, and I'm going to be the chief of police of Palm Springs. Phil, you're going to be my sergeant. And, Don, you're also going to be a member of the force. Well, what am I going to be, Jack? Mary, you're going to play the part of a glamorous movie star who came to Palm Springs to be with her husband. And at the start of the play, he murders you. Oh, Jack, if he murders me, I won't get in laughs. All right, then, you murder him. Thanks, Jack. Now, Larry, Larry Stevens... Yes, Mr. Benny? Uh, you're going to be on the police force, too. Come on, keep moving, keep Not moving. Not yet. Wait till it starts. <laughs> and take off that Hoover button. I'll give you a badge. <laughs> Now, all right, kids, this play will go on immediately after a song by... Hold it a minute. Come in. Uh, Mr. Benny, I just talked to the owner, and you can have that house for $50,000. Look, Mr. Fulton, a few minutes ago you wanted $70,000. Now it's $50,000. Why is the price coming down so fast? Those termites are hungrier than we thought they were. <laughs> well, in that case, I don't want the house. Oh, don't worry about that, Mr. Benny. The termites will be out by tomorrow. How do you know? They're getting so fast. <laughs> going to get fat off of me, so goodbye. Goodbye. Sorry I started looking for a place. Come on, Larry, let's have your song. That was... That was Day by Day, sung by Larry Stevens. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight, we are going to offer a mystery melodrama entitled Murder at the Lone Palm, or Her Husband Asked for Some Wine, So She Gave Him Both Barrels. <laughs> The scene opens at the Palm Springs Police Station. Police Captain O'Benny is in his office behind closed doors, grilling a suspect. Curtain. Music. Now listen, you. You're dealing with Captain O'Benny this time, and I want to warn you, anything you say will be held against you. Now, you're accused of robbing the post office, sticking up a train, stealing the hammer steep diamonds, and then you boldly held up the First National Bank and killed the cashier. Now, confess. You did it, didn't you? No. Okay, you can go. <laughs> Peter said yes, I'd have hung them. 
Nobody puts anything over me. There's the phone, Captain. I'll get it. Hello? Palm Springs Police Station and Date Shop. <laughs> Captain O'Benny speaking. What? Yes, we have some with the stuffing in the middle and the walnut on top. Oh, you want the walnuts in the middle and the stuffing on top. We're out of those. Try the city hall. Goodbye. Oh, Harris. Yes, Chief. You arrested two fellas last night. I want you to stop filling this jail with crooks. You understand? Well, I got to do something with them. During the height of the season, this jail is for tourists. I'm getting $12 a cell, American plan. You catch crooks during the summer. Morning, Morning, Chief. Chief. Hiya, man. How are things? A lot of drunks on my beat. A lot of drunks on my beat, too. Well, what do you know? Pickle beats. (laughs) (laughs) Cut it out, O'Harris. I'll take it. Palm Springs Police Station and Date Shop. O'Benny speaking. Hello, Chiefy. This is Missy LaRue at the Lone Palm. Yes, yes. What is it, Miss LaRue? Get a good grip on your badge. My husband has just been murdered. Oh, he has, eh? Do you know who murdered your husband? No. Have you got any ideas? Well, now that he's dead, yes. (laughs) All right, Miss LaRue, I'm coming right over. Okay, Chiefy, and bring a half a pound of dates. We always do. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) Come on, man, Mitzi LaRue's husband has been murdered, and I'm going to find out who did it, or my name ain't... I'll take it. Palm Springs Police Station and Date Shop. Captain O'Benny talking. Oh, Mr. Benny, I'm here with the owner, and you can have the house for $40,000. $40,000, eh? Well, I might be interested. However, I'd have to... Talk fast. The termites are spreading mayonnaise on the telephone. (laughs) Well, that settles it. I don't want it. Goodbye. Now, come on, man. Let's go. And we'll find the murderer of Missy LaRue's husband, or my name ain't... All right, men. Here we are at the Lone Palm. Say, this is a pretty classy place, isn't it? It certainly is. Look at that swimming pool. How about it, Chief? Why not? Boy, that felt good. <laughs> All right, come on, man. We got a mystery to solve. This is Miss LaRue's bungalow right here. Come in. Hello, Miss LaRue. I'm Captain O'Benny. I'm here to solve the murder of your. Wait a minute. Where's your husband's body? In the backyard. Was he killed in this hotel room? Yes, but checkout time is 3 o'clock. <laughs> Tell me everything you know about this crime. I don't know anything. I was just sitting here popping my bubble gum. You didn't hear a shot? No, I really pop it, Pop. <laughs> well, come on, O'Hara. Let's look around this room for clues. Come on, keep moving. Keep moving. Stephen, on. that's the body. <laughs> Now, come on, O'Harris, let's go... Hey, Chief, look, there's a gun on the table, and it's still smoking. A smoking gun, eh? What do you got to say to that, Miss LaRue? My gun's been smoking Lucky Strike for nine... That's not what I mean. (laughs) Now, listen, man, she's a pretty smart dame. So let's give her the... Hey, Chief, Chief, the doorknob's moving. There's someone in that closet. Where? Right there. You're right, Wilson. Stand back, everybody. We'll get him out of there. Now, come on. Come on out of that closet, or I'll shoot. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. It's me, Fulton. Oh, the real estate man. Are you the murderer? Well, what do you think I am with this knife in my hand? The man who came to dinner? <laughs> oh, then you're the one that killed Mitzi LaRue's husband. Yes, I did it. I did it, and I'm glad. All right, then come clean. Tell me, why did you do it? I'll tell you why. He was the toughest customer I ever had, that's why. I offered him a house for $70,000, and he didn't buy it. Well, then I came down to 60000 he still said no. Then fifty. then forty. then thirty. And he kept saying no, no, no. Suddenly, something within me snapped. It was driving me mad. Mr. Fulton? I went crazy. So I took out my gun and let him have it. Bang, 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 bang. Mr. Fulton? (laughs) I'm glad I did it. Glad I did it. And I'll do it again. I'll do it to anybody who refuses to buy a house. Mr. Fulton? 
I tried to sell you a house, didn't I? But you, you kept tormenting me. No, you kept saying. No, no. I came down from 70,000 to 60,000, to 50,000, to 40,000, but still you said no. Mr. Fulton. Now you're going to buy that house or I'll... Chief, Chief, don't worry, I'm armed. Have you got a gun? No, a pen. Where do I sign? (laughs) Right here on the dotted line. There is no dotted line. There is now. (laughs) Oh, yes, it's on my chest. There you are. The house is mine. Thank you, Mr. Benny, and goodbye. Oh, Miss LaRue. Yes? You can tell your husband to get up now. We've made the deal. (laughs) Well, how do you like that? He tricked me into buying that house. All right, men. I've got a house now. And I'll get those termites out of there, or my name ain't... You know that house you just bought from me? Yes. Well, I can get you $200,000 for it. $200,000? Who in the world would pay that much? The termites. They're putting up a dollar apiece. <laughs> well, let them have it. They've got most of it anyway. Good night, Strike program starring Ray Milland with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you our master of ceremonies, a man who... Wait a minute, Don, wait a minute. What's the idea of saying the Lucky Strike program starring Ray Milland? Well, Jack, I didn't see anybody get up and walk out. (laughs) I mean, that has nothing to do with it. Oh, Jack, stop pouting. Your lower lip looks like a shoehorn. I'm not pouting. Well, you told us yourself that Ray Milland was going to be our guest. That still doesn't entitle him to top billing. He's just a star in pictures. I'm a star of stage, screen, and radio. And we'll milk cows if you back him into Beverly Hills. Well, now you're just being smart. I merely said that Don didn't have to give Ray Milan star billing when he's only going to be our guest. Jack, I only did that as a matter of courtesy. Don, if you want to be courteous, do it on the Jenny Sims show, not mine. (laughs) And another thing. Jackson, I don't know what you're beefing about. I've been with you for eight years, and I've never had no star billing. Well, you've been with me for ten years. I don't count the two years I was auditioning. Look, just be happy you got the job. Now, let's get on with... Gosh, Ray Milan should have been here a half hour ago. I can't understand what's holding him up. I saw his picture, Jackson. I couldn't understand what held him up either. (laughs) Yeah. I saw the picture. I went to the box office, bought a ticket, and they gave me my change in pretzels. Stop with the gags already. I'm going to call Ray's home. Oh, Jack, 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 you don't have to. Ray Milan just came in. He did? Good, good. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest, one of the finest actors in Hollywood, the star of The Lost Weekend, and winner of this year's Academy Award, Ray Milland. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Say, uh, Ray, Ray, how come you're so late? Uh, I'm sorry, Jack, but I stopped off at the newspaper office to put an ad in for a butler. Oh, I I thought you had a butler. Oh, I have three, as a matter of fact, but they want a fourth for bridge. (laughs) Oh, well, wouldn't it be cheaper to teach him gin rummy and let one of them go? If it was Jack, he'd teach him solitaire and let two of them go. Mary, please. Well, Ray, it certainly is a wonderful achievement, getting the Oscar. Tell me, how did it make you feel winning the Academy Award? Oh, I don't know, Jack. I don't feel any different. I'm still the same sweet, modest, lovable fellow I always was. (laughs) Gee, if I ever won it, I'd be a louse. Gosh, 
Ray, what I wouldn't give just to see the Oscar. Well, Jack, by coincidence, I just happened to have it with me. Hmm. <laughs> Weighs 25 pounds. He just happens to have it. <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, let me see it, Ray. Yeah, yeah. Gee, isn't it cute? A bronze Oscar with a little ice bag on its head. <laughs> you know, Ray, this may surprise you, but I've never won an Academy Award. Why, Jack Benny, you haven't. <laughs> Why, Ray Milland, what a performance. <laughs> Very quiet. Well, oh, Jack... Jack, why don't you introduce me? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Ray, I want you to meet the members of my cast. This is Mary Livingston. Hello, Mary. I'm glad to know you. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Milan. Would you consider going out with a girl who doesn't drink? <laughs> Mary, please. Why, certainly, Mary. In fact, I like to go out with girls who don't drink. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Jack likes to go out with girls who don't eat. <laughs> They're hard to find, sister. <laughs> and Ray, uh, Ray, this is, uh, this is Phil Harris. Hello, Phil. Amateur. <laughs> Amateur? <laughs> Phil, you wouldn't appreciate this, but Lost Weekend was something new, something daring. I doubt if any other actor would have the stomach, the courage... <laughs> I doubt if any other actor would have the courage to attempt a role like that. Well, that shows you how much you know, Jackson. Right now, Gary Cooper's doing the same thing in Saratoga Drunk. <laughs> That's Trunk, Saratoga Trunk. Well, I'm glad you told me. I ain't gonna waste my cabbage going to see a lot of baggage. <laughs> yeah, baggage. Now, Ray, the reason I... Phil... Why are you staring at Ray like that? Well, I'm just admiring the guy, Jackson. He does it and gets an Academy Award. I do it and get a hangover. <laughs> well, until the weekend, go get lost. Now, Ray, the reason I asked... Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, Ray. Ray, the reason I asked you to come over here is because tonight, for our feature attraction, we're going to do our version of your picture, The Lost Weekend. Now, naturally, since I'm the, uh, <coughs> the star of this program, the leading role will be played by me. Now, wait a minute, Jack. Don't you think that as long as I originated the part in the picture, I should also play it here? I do not. <laughs> I mean, just, just because you won an Academy Award has nothing to do with it. After all, when I was your age, I could have won an Oscar, too. Except there were no Academy Awards in those days. There were no movies, either. <laughs> no. And darn few people. had awfully long arms, but they were still people. <laughs> anyway, Ray, I think I should play the lead. But, Jack, that doesn't make sense. You brought me up here because of the lost weekend, and you give me nothing to do. Well, maybe... Say, I've got a wonderful idea. Let's both play the part. We'll be twin brothers. Twin brothers? Yeah, we'll give them a double feature. We'll be the Burnham brothers. How about it? Okay with me. That's fine. Now, Phil, you'll be our older brother who tries to convince us... That drinking is very evil. <laughs> Who's going to convince me? <laughs> Phil, it's just a part. After all, you know, I don't drink and neither does Ray. Now, Mary, you're going to play Jane Wyman's part, the girl that Ray and I are in love with, but you can't make up your mind which one of us you want. The UNO should have problems that easy. <laughs> Mary, don't be so sure. You know, you might have to take Ray. Now, this play will go on immediately after the... I'll take it. Hello? Telephone call for Mr. Ray Milan. Oh, oh, just a minute. It's for you, Ray. For me? Well, hello? Hello, Mr. Milan. This is Rochester. <laughs> I saw by an ad in the paper that you wanted a butler, and I called up to find out about it. But, uh, aren't you already working? I sure am! <clears throat> well, why are you dissatisfied with your present position? Well, I've concluded that any relationship between the hours I work and the money I get is purely coincidental. <laughs> you consider yourself underpaid, huh? How much are you making now? Well, frankly, I'm ashamed to tell you. 
But if I have a suit cleaned and go to a movie in the same week, one of them has to be on the installment plan. Well, you spoke of long hours. What kind of hours have you been working? From eight in the morning till dark. Well, those aren't such long hours for a butler working until dark. Under normal conditions, no. But Mr. Benny has a sun lamp outside the kitchen window to fool me. And... <laughs> and that sun lamp fools you? Not only me, his chickens have been laying six eggs a day. <laughs> I see. Well, if you go to work for me, you'll find that your duties won't be hard, but they'll be exacting. Exacting? Yes. For instance, I like my breakfast served in bed. But unlike other people, I can't wait. I want it there when I awaken. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think you could have my breakfast ready the minute I wake up? Yes, sir. I'll pull the cork out the night before. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. I think you have a mistaken idea about my drinking, Rochester, because I never... Rochester? Ray, let me ask that phone. Hello, Rochester. Is that you? Uh-oh. Rochester, why did you call up Ray Milan looking for a job? It was an accident, boss. I called up the Homeway Laundry and got this number by mistake. The laundry? Then why'd you ask for Ray Milan? I didn't. I asked for May Dilban. <laughs> May Dilban? She's a start girl on the fourth toe. <laughs> Rochester, that's a mighty weak story. What do you expect on a moment's notice? A bestseller? <laughs> Funny, and I'll talk to you when I get home. Goodbye. Goodbye. Imagine doing a thing like that behind my back. Come on, Larry, let's have a song. <laughs> that was Come Closer to Me, sung by Larry Stevens. Very good, Larry. I bought that record you made of that song, and it's swell. Thank you, Mr. Benny. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight. Our version of the Academy Award-winning picture, The Lost Weekend. As our story opens, Ray and Jack Burnham, twin brothers, have been persuaded by their elder brother, Philip, to go to the country for the weekend. At the moment, the twin brothers are in the room packing. Curtain. Music. <laughs> Gosh, Jack, I don't know why we have to go away on this weekend. Neither do I, but Brother Philip insists upon it. Are we all packed? Oh, just about. Shirts, ties, sweaters, socks, quartz, fifths, and pints. <laughs> Good. And put the bottles on the other side of the suitcase. My underwear is snapping at them. <laughs> now, let's see. Hello, boys. Hello, Hello brother, brother Philip. Hello, brother Philip. Uh-uh, those bottles again. Now, look, boys, you've got to stop this drinking because we're all going out the country for a weekend and the fresh air will do us a lot of good. Well, I'm not going. Now, sure you are. Think of it, fellas. Chickens, horses, rabbits, and the scent of new mown hay. <laughs> Now, you've just got to go because it'll be a wonderful weekend. But why do we have to go? Because we want it on truth or consequences. <laughs> oh. Now, look, boys, I hate to keep lecturing, but don't you know how bad liquor is for you? Don't you realize that alcohol is your worst enemy? Liquor isn't good for you. Now, you should stay away from it. Ladies and gentlemen, the opinions expressed by Mr. Harris are written in the script and are not necessarily his own. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the country with you. Well, you better get ready. We're leaving on the 715 train. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye, Goodbye brother, brother Philip. Philip. <laughs> Gee, I hate to go away for a weekend. Me too. I was figuring on losing this one. <laughs> yeah. Quick, brother Philip's coming back. Hide those bottles. Okay. There. Come in. Oh, it's you, Jane. Hello, boys. I just saw Philip, and he told me you're all going away for the weekend. Yes, we are. <laughs> you boys are so wonderful. You know, sometimes I regret that you two are twins. I just can't make up my mind. Make up your mind? What do you mean? Well, there are two of you and only one of me. <laughs> That's funny. We always see two of you. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, don't forget, boys. Your train leaves at 7.15. Goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye brother, brother Philip. We, we mean goodbye, Janie. <laughs> Gee, what twins we are. We both make the same mistake. Quick, she's gone. Let's open the bottle. Okay. Oh, gee, look. We've only got two bottles left. Well, let's drink one and hide the other. Okay, I'll put it up there in the chandelier. Good. Oh, darn it. I can't reach it. Well, give it to me. I'm higher than you are. <laughs> you are not. I can do it. All right, but don't screw the bottle into the socket like you did the last time. I turned on the switch, it blew out a powerhouse at Boulder Dam. Don't worry, don't worry. There, the bottle's in the chandelier. Now, let's open the other one. And... Oh, boys. Yes, yes brother, brother Philip. Philip. Jane and I are going to the... Wait a minute, give me that bottle. I'm going to pour it down the sink. Oh, no, no, brother Philip, don't pour it down the sink. That's right, brother Philip, let Ray drink it. That stuff will eat out the plumbing. <laughs> Well, I don't care, boys. I'm not going to give it back to you. And remember, you're not to leave this room until it's time to go to the train. We, we won't, won't, brother, brother Philip. Philip. Come on, Jack. He's gone. Let's go down to Nat's bar room and he'll give us a drink. Okay. Come on, Nat. Set him up. Set him up. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Nothing so and not another drop until you paid the bill you ran up this afternoon. How much do we owe you? Eighteen thousand dollars. Oh. All right, all right, you can keep your old liquor. We'll go into the country. Yeah. Come on, Ray, let's go. All right. Hold me up. No. You hold me up. I held you up yesterday. <laughs> Mmm, smell that fresh air. Yeah, isn't it awful? <laughs> That's what's wrong with this country. It's full of it. <laughs> Come on, let's go down to the corner of Joe's bar. That won't do us any good. I haven't got any money. Neither have I. Sweet. Sweet. Not on nickel. Let's try the other side of the street. No. <laughs> this singing won't get us any drinks. I'll go home and get my violin. That's my line. <laughs> I'm tired. Let's lie down here in the gutter. Okay. Wait a minute, Ray. Don't you want to put your head up on the curb? No, I always sleep without a pillow. <laughs> my feet are cold. Pull up that manhole cover. Well, now I'm comfy. They can't keep me in here. I'm Napoleon. They can't keep me in here. I'm Napoleon. Well, get on my back. I'm your horse. Ray. Ray, where are we? I don't know. Let's ask that man in a white coat. Oh, yes. Say, mister. Yes? Where are we? You're in the alcoholic ward. Alcoholic ward? I want to get out of here. Let me out. Get us out of here. Oh, you don't want to leave until you've seen the floor show. Floor show? Yes. In the middle of the night, you start seeing things. You won't see pink elephants. You're going to see red, white, and blue turkeys. Oh, goody, they changed the bill. <laughs> and then you're going to see tiny rabbits in straw hats. Midget monkeys that come through the keyhole. You know, the kind of talent that's handled by Madman Munt. <laughs> You'll see thousands of little snakes that knit themselves into a sweater. And that isn't all. Stop it! Stop it! Oh, I can stop it, but you can. You're going to see beetles. Twenty-three of them running in the Santa Anita Handicap. <laughs> and eleven of them are in the field. <laughs> There'll be grasshoppers five feet tall. And there'll be woodpeckers pecking on your head. Peck, 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 peck. Yes, sir, you bet. And how? Stop it, stop it, stop it. Let us out of here. Now, before the floor show, 
And it'll start as soon as it gets dark. It's like the doctor was saying to me. Delirium is a disease of the night. Well, good night. <laughs> hey. hey, he's gone. Now's our chance to get out. There's an open window. Okay, let's go. Well, here we are, back in our room. That's funny. We didn't even open the door. No, we crawled in under it. Oh. oh, I... You know, Jack, we'll either have to give up drinking or get our knees half-soled. Come on. Let's look for that bottle we hid. Let's see now. Where do we put it? Maybe it's in this dresser. Yes, the dresser. The dresser. Maybe it's behind the bookcase. No, it isn't here either. We gotta find that bottle. Maybe it's behind the sofa. Let me move it out. Yeah, the sofa. The sofa. We gotta find that bottle. Wait a minute. The china closet. Yeah, yeah, the china closet. Let's go. Hmm, paper plate. bottle isn't there. I'm getting weak. I gotta have a drink. Sit down and rest a while, Ray. Get your mind off of it. I'll turn on the radio. There. I'll sit down. But I gotta have a drink. I tell you, I gotta have a drink. That's it, Clover. Hit the spot. That's the spot. Get that off! Oh, find that bottle. Find that bottle. I got to have a drink. Wait a minute. It's getting dark out. Turn on the lights. All right. <laughs> Another powerhouse at Boulder. <laughs> Here it is, Ray. We found the bottle. We found it. Yeah, we found it. We found it. Say, Ray, I was just thinking. Wouldn't it be awful if Mother were here? Yeah. There isn't enough for three of us. <laughs> Sorry we blew out the lights. Now we're in the dark. Can you imagine that guy in the hospital saying we were going to see little animals? Yeah. Let me have a drink. What'd you say? <laughs> I didn't say anything. Oh. Give me another drink. <laughs> huh? I didn't say anything. <laughs> you mean to stand there flapping your wings and tell me you didn't say anything? Then so what are you doing on the chandelier? I'm not on the chandelier. Well, there's something up on the... Look, it's a bat. It's a bat. I see it. It's picking the straw hair off the little monkey. <laughs> oh, the monkey. He's coming at me. He's coming at me. Keep him away from me. Keep him away from me. Oh, this little animal. And here come more of them. They're coming to the keyhole. They're swarming around. They're getting closer. They're surrounding us. Ray, Ray, look out. I can't help it. I can't help it. They're gone. Tell me, Ray. What did you do? I threw my Oscar at him. <laughs> I knew those things would come in handy. Ladies and gentlemen, two years ago, Dennis Day left our program and went into the Navy. At about the same time, another boy was honorably discharged from the Army Air Forces, and we were very fortunate in getting him to pinch hit while Dennis was away. Of course, I'm referring to Larry Stevens. Now that the war is over, Dennis Day will be back with us next week. Larry, I want to thank you for the wonderful job you've done on our show. You were a great asset, and I'm sure that our listeners feel the same way I do. Well, thank you, Mr. Benny. It sure has been grand being with you and your whole gang. Well, it was grand having you. We'll be hearing you on the air and seeing you soon in the new 20th Century Fox picture, Centennial Summer. Good luck, kid. Thank you, Mr. Benny. Daniel Lamb appeared through the cut of 
Picture of Paramount Pictures. Starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, today, March 17th, is St. Patrick's Day. As you all know, St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. So today, we bring you a man who was run out of Waukegan, Jack Benny. <laughs> said man there anyway. Thank you, thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Betty talking. And Don, for your information, I wasn't run out of Waukegan. It was merely a request by the city fathers and mine. <laughs> and being a sharp guy, I took the hint and two shirts and left. Well, let's not talk about me after all. This is St. Benny's, I mean St. Patrick's Day. That's why I'm wearing this shamrock in my lapel. Shamrock? Yes. That's a moth that took a bite out of that $12 suit and turned green. All right, don't be funny. This is a very good suit. Taste it. I mean, feel it. Anyway, why aren't you wearing something green today? I am wearing something green. See? Oh, yes, yes. What is it? It's that gold bracelet you gave me for Christmas. <laughs> Mary, that's an old joke. All I know is I polish my other bracelets. This one, the gardener takes care of. Well, that's appreciation for after all, Mary, it wasn't easy to get that bracelet. I spent over three hours at that claw machine. And now, ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> Good. I didn't know it was going to be that good. I'm going to say that. You know, you're Say, Jackson. Me. What? You're talking about St. Patrick's Day. Did I ever tell you the one about that friend of mine who got an Irish car? An Irish car? Yeah, every time you blow the horn, it plays Ireland must be heaven because my motor came from there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harris, you're the Barry Fitzgerald of the Bobby Sox. <laughs> well, pull out your garters and get out of here, will you? Put on your garters, right? He always tries to run Say, one... Jack. What? Jack, since this is St. Patrick's Day, don't you think we ought to do this a little This program is starting out like we had no rehearsals at all. And you want to know something? We did it. Everybody walks in any time they want. Hey, Jackson, they holler. What is it? What is well, it? Well, Jack, this being St. Patrick's Day, don't you think we ought to do a little play for our Irish listeners? Well, we're doing better than that, Don. Tonight, for the first time since his release from the Navy, Dennis Day, the smiling Irish songbird, will be back with us. Oh, so the kid's coming back, huh, Jackson? Yep. Gosh, Jack, Dennis has been gone for two years. I'll bet the Navy has changed him a lot. I'll bet it has, too. Anyway, he ought to be here by now. I think I'll call his house and see what's keeping him. Say, Mabel, what is it, guys, Phil? <laughs> Mr. Benny's line is flashing. Yeah, I wonder what Bloomer Girl wants now. <laughs> I'll find out. Hello, Mr. Benny. Huh? Dennis Day? What's his number? Okay, I'll call you back when I get him. Say, Mabel, did you hear Mr. Benny's program last week? Yeah, Ray Moline was on it. Gosh, he's wonderful, even if he is the lost weekend. <laughs> Listen, Mabel, if you think Milan is the lost weekend, you should have a date with Benny. <laughs> Those are my sentiments exactly. You want to know something, Gertrude? What? The contest has been over for six weeks and I still can't stand him. <laughs> Yeah. You know, Mabel, two weeks ago he asked me to go to the Academy Award ceremonies, but I had another date. Gee, Gertrude, how come Mr. Benny always asked you to all those swanky affairs? Well, why shouldn't he? After all, my mother gave him the best years of her life. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't mind going out on a date with Mr. Benny, but he's a sneaky type. <laughs> Sneaky? Yeah, he's the kind who lures an unsuspecting girl into his car, drives her out to a dark spot, pretends he's out of gear, stops the car, and then spends the next two hours talking about his picture. <laughs> it's enough to discourage a person, believe me. <laughs> I'll say. You know, Mabel, I got a confession to make. Once I let Mr. Benny kiss me, why, go to a gear shift. <laughs> Say, uh, tell me, go to, what are his kisses like? Well, it's like when you're blowing bubble gum and the bubble collapses against your face. <laughs> Between you and me, 
I'd rather have the gum. <laughs> yeah. Please, Dennis Day's number doesn't answer. I'd better tell Blue Eyes about it. Hello? Oh, we'll try him again later, Gertrude. Goodbye. Oh, say, Gertrude, uh, what are you doing tonight? Tomorrow night? Tuesday night? <laughs> Wednesday night? Thursday night? Christmas Eve? <laughs> oh, you're, you're going to visit your mother. Well, don't be surprised when you walk in, sister. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, we might as well get on with the show till Dennis gets here. Come on, Phil, let's have a band number. Will you? <laughs> yes, sir. And who's sorry now, played by Phil Harris and his Hour of Harm Orchestra. <laughs> hey, Phil... You know, this is St. Patrick's Day. Why don't you do something for the occasion? Something Irish. I did. I put a harp in my band. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. You got a girl playing it. See, you know, her fingers must get callous and sore plucking on all those strings. Well, it's her own fault, Jackson. She forgot the bow, so let her do the best she can. <laughs> She's our orchestra leader for ten years now. <laughs> Phil, you don't use it. Come in. I beg your pardon, but hello again. Dennis! 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 Welcome back, kid. Welcome back. Gee, it's good to see you. Gosh, Mary, doesn't he look wonderful? Oh, he sure does. Oh, boy, I never expected this. Are you going to kiss me too, Miss Livingston? <laughs> Why, certainly, Dennis. Doggone, Dennis, I can't get over You look so mature. You've changed so. Well, sure he's changed, Jackson. This kid's been in the Navy for two years. He's grown up. Yeah, up. <laughs> hmm. Dennis, tell us about yourself. Did you enjoy your two years in the Navy? I sure did, Miss Livingston. The Navy's wonderful. I went all over the South Pacific, and I saw plenty. <laughs> I imagine you did, kid. <laughs> Say, I bet you had a lot of fun, too. Say, Dennis. Dennis, I've been wanting to ask you something. Uh, tell me, kid, uh, how about those waves? That's what made me seasick. <laughs> Yeah, yeah grown, grown up, up. yeah. <laughs> you know, Dennis, I was all over the South Pacific, too, and I ran into some pretty rough seas. In fact, once I was tossed overboard. Oh, I was tossed overboard lots of times. You were? Yeah, but the captain made the fellows cut it out. <laughs> Dennis, the boys kept throwing you overboard. That's terrible. Oh, it wasn't so bad. The Japs kept throwing me back. <laughs> he was a pickle in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Say, Dennis, when you first joined the Navy, how did they know how to classify you? I mean, how did they know what rank to give you? Oh, that was easy, Miss Livingston. First, I had to fill out a lot of forms, answer a lot of questions, and then for two days, they gave me a written test. For two days? That must have been quite a test. And after it was all over, they made me an ensign. An ensign? <laughs> an ensign? Yeah. I wonder what they'd have made me if I'd have passed. <laughs> Maybe it's just as well you didn't. We won the war this way. <laughs> well, come on, Dennis. We all want to hear a song. What's it going to be? Well, since today is St. Patrick's Day, I thought I'd sing Danny Boy. That's swell. Go sure. Go right ahead. Yeah. Very good. Very good. That was Danny Boy sung by Dennis Day. And now... Say, Mr. Benny, I meant to ask you, how's Mr. Allen? Who? Fred Allen. Well, kid, it was nice seeing you again. <laughs> No, no, Phil. In fact, I'm glad he brought it up. Dennis, I'm happy to tell you that Fred Allen has the same old program, the same old joke, the same oh, old... Oh, wait a minute, Jack. That's not fair. I've heard all of Fred's programs, and they've been very funny. Yeah, but Mary, I wouldn't mind if his joke just laid there. But they crawl out of the radio and stain your rugs. <laughs> some, some program. That just shows what you know, Jackson. I think the funniest thing in radio is Allen's Alley. Oh, you do, huh? Yeah. I think so, too. Oh, you do, eh? I think so, too. Oh, you do, eh? I think Mr. Benny is much funnier than Mr. Allen. I think so, too. <laughs> oh, you do, eh? <laughs> yes, I do. And, that, and, what, and what's so great about Allen's Alley? Anybody with half an ounce of talent can do that. Oh, yeah? I'd like to see you do it. Well, I'll just show you, sister. Phil, get your band ready while I put this clothespin on my nose so I'll sound like Fred Allen. Now, I'll go down to the alley, and you kids will play the parts of the people that live there. Okay, Phil, music. <laughs> And 
so, Kenny Delmar. I won't say it's been very windy, but last oh, night... Oh, Mr. Allen! Mr. Allen! Well, well, if it isn't Cleveland. <laughs> Gee, Cleveland, Kenny Delmar and I were just discussing the high wind we've been having here. Well, Mama says that all the wind is caused by the pickets. The pickets? <laughs> yes. She says they carry their signs too high and walk too fast. And Mama also uh, just says... Just a minute, Cleveland. I have a brother-in-law in the last row who's not quite through laughing. <laughs> Anyway, I imagine your mother knows all about pickets. I understand she's been picketing Lindy's restaurant because the lamb chops look better in their panties than she does in slacks. Oh, my I don't know. Goodness. You write this stuff on Thursday, and then on Sunday, nothing happens. <laughs> what was that, Cleveland? Oh, Mama doesn't wear slacks anymore. She doesn't? Why did she stop wearing slacks? A policeman gave her a ticket for pulling a trailer without a license. <laughs> well, so much for your mother and her homegrown bustle. We've got to get down to Benny's Boulevard. And uh, what is your question for tonight? Our question is, is Fred Allen or Jack Benny the better comedian? Shall we leave? As one of my eyes said to the other, let's pack our bags and go. <laughs> Well, I see Senator Harris is home. There's a ten-gallon hat and a five-gallon jug on the porch. <laughs> Let's knock on the bunk hole and see what he's got to say. Somebody, I say, somebody knock. Yes, I... Harris is the name. Senator Harris, that is. I'm from the West. From the West, When eh? I'm east of the Mississippi River, I'm in enemy territory. <laughs> I hate the East. My favorite actress is Mae West. Look. No look. man living can make me go see East Land. Oh, I, I never can. go out of the house on Easter Sunday. Senator. When oh. I bake bread, I won't use East. That's ye. I thought you'd get a rise out of it. <laughs> Up, son. What you got on your mind? This is a free country. Well, I never to... saw anyone like this on your mouth, just like the front door of General Motors. Wide open, but nothing's coming out. You're tired, eh? <laughs> Well, Senator, the question tonight is, who is the better comedian, Fred Allen or Jack Benny? I brought, I say, I brought it up in the Senate. Now watch this one, son. It's pretty. I brought it up in the Senate, and it made Senator Tidings glad. Ha, ha, ha. Glad Tidings. That's a pun, son. I heard. That's an anecdote, an anecdote. Now, wait a minute. You're like a midget, son. Everything goes over your head. Own up, son. You got a mind like a chick. What? A cluck, that is. <laughs> Look, Senator, just tell me which comedian you like best, Allen or Benny. Where's Allen from? Boston. How about Benny? He's from Waukegan. Waukegan's west of Boston, ain't it? Yes. Benny's the one. So long, son. So long. Remember the words of Horace Greeley. Go west, young man. West, that is. So long. So long. So long. So long. So long. Where's that sound effect, man? Always late. I suppose the senator has gone back to his newspaper. He spends all night reading Westbrook Peckler. I wonder, I wonder if Dennis Day, I mean Titus Day, is at home. He's always so moody. Howdy, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Day, I see you're at home. Yep, day in and day out, days in. <laughs> But you say your eyes look all red. Been crying, Bob, reading a sad book. What's the title of it? Forever Amber. <laughs> the title is Forever Amber isn't a sad book. Tis when you're my age, Bob. <laughs> Very important question to ask you tonight. Who do you think is the better comedian, Fred Allen or Jack Benny? 
Well, Bob, that's a moot question. Moot question? Yep. Moot be Alan, moot be Benny. I see. Well, which one do you consider the better comedian? Never hear them myself. When they come on, I put my radio out in the hen house. In the hen house? Why? Steps up production. Every, every time Alan and Benny lay an egg, my hens try to match it. And that really increases your egg production? Did up to last Sunday. What happened last Sunday? All my hens kill themselves straining. So long, Bob. Well, I guess Mr. Day has his troubles, just like the city folk. Well, here's the last house in the alley. I wonder what a knock here will bring. Greetings, all. It's time for play. For Rogers here with Rondelay. <laughs> You have more poems for us tonight. Oh, indubitably. Have you heard? Said the rum to the gin, I understand you're going steady with Ray Milan. No. Oh, I said to myself, this is not for me, as I picked up the dice and threw a three. No. Oh, my mother has rolled her stockings down since she heard Van Johnson is back in town. That's it. Just... Tonight we are trying to find out who is the better comedian, Fred Allen or Jack Benny. Precisely why I'm here. I have written a poem. Now, what is your... <laughs> <laughs> what? Now, what... Wait till I get this on site. Uh, well, what is your comedian's poem called? Allen or Benny. How does it go? Allen or Benny. The question rings, and the nation is put to a test. From city to hamlet, you hear the cry, is Alan or Benny best? Alan has bags and Benny is cheap, and they're both on Sunday night. So millions of people from coast to coast tune in to hear them fight. And I often wonder just what it means as they hurl their epitaphs. For while they're knocking each other out, Cass Daly gets all the laughs. <laughs> well, I Thank you, Rochester Openshaw. And now Phil Harris and his no-goodman orchestra will play onesie-twosie because that's as high as they can count. Take it, boys. <laughs> by Mr. Wilson. 
Mr. Wilson, if you please. Thank you. I beg your pardon, Mr. Benny. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Wilson. What is it, Mr. Harris? Well, I'd like to propose an amendment to joke four on page six. Why? Because it stinks. <laughs> I see. Mr. Harris has expressed an opinion that joke four on page six has an aromatic quality which is not pleasant. We will take a vote. Miss Livingston? I agree. Mr. Wilson? I agree. Mr. Day? I can't tell. I have a cold. <laughs> Motion passed. And now we will proceed Oh, with... Jack, for heaven's sake, this is silly. What? Why do we have to go through this every time we have a rehearsal? Why can't we rehearse like we used to? Because everybody took advantage of it. You come in late, you wouldn't pay attention, you sat around reading newspapers instead of scripts. That's why. But, Jack, you can't rehearse this way. You've got to loosen up. After all, this is a comedy program. Ooh, what she said. <laughs> Damn it. Well, Libby's right, Jackson. We can't be funny when we're so formal and still. Bill, you're the only one that comes in stiff. <laughs> That's why we're rehearsing this way. Remember, I'm the star. I'm the star. I'm the star. <laughs> quiet, Polly. Quiet, Polly. Quiet, Polly. <laughs> Polly, if you don't keep quiet, I'm going to... You know what. Oh, Jack, not again. What does he do, Libby? Every time the Polly talks back to him, he takes her out of the cage, opens the front door, and hands her a road map to Capistrano. <laughs> Mary. That's the only parrot registered with the automobile club. Never mind. Let's get started with the rehearsal. There's no... There's, uh, now, here's the way the show will run. We'll do our usual opening spot, a band number, and then Dennis's songs... Sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and Coca-Cola. Get your sandwiches, hard-boiled eggs, and Coca-Cola here. Oh, yes. I'll have a roast beef. Here you are. Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll... Hard-boiled eggs, cooked fresh this morning, roast beef sandwiches. I'll have a hard-boiled egg. Here you are. Thank you. And now we'll... Uh... Uh, may I have a paper napkin, please? Yes, ma'am. Here you are. Thank you. <laughs> Roger. 
Rochester, please untie my shoes, will you? Your shoes? Yes. I do it myself, but Benny's back and Lumbago's got him. <laughs> hey, did you hear that? Benny's back and Lumbago's got him. Hey, Rochester, do you think I should use that joke on my program tomorrow? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, that's all I need from Rochester. Good night. Good night, boy. I'm not even sleepy. I think I'll sit up for a while and read a book. Let's see. Here's one. Clara Klingenfield, Girl Bricklayer. <laughs> no, I read that. Here's another one. I Married a Smudge Pot. <laughs> see, that was a hot one. I remember that one. Here's another one. Your darn one last near made it. just a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> I wonder if... Say, wait a minute. Here's a book I haven't read. I Stand Condemned by Macmillan Q. Langley. Hmm, I Stand Condemned. Gee, that's an exciting title. I think I'll read this book. Chapter One. I Stand Condemned. <laughs> Man with a round face. 
He reminded me somewhat of Peter Lorby. And when he spoke, his voice, too, reminded me of Peter Lorby. He tapped me on the shoulder instead. Pardon me, sir, but uh, may I trouble you for a match? A match? I'm sorry I don't have one, but I'll let you use my cigarette lighter. Thank you. You're very kind. Hey, you, come back with that lighter. Give me that. All right, all right. Here's your lighter. I thought you just wanted to light a cigarette. I do, but my cigarette is home. <laughs> oh, yeah? Then why were you running toward the railroad station? My home is in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pittsburgh? Yes. I married a smudge pot. <laughs> smudge pot? Now, wait a minute. You were trying to steal my cigarette lighter. No, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, I'd like to buy it. I'll give you $20,000 for it. $20,000? Well, I don't want to take advantage of you. I'll tell you what. I'll throw in an extra flint. <laughs> thank you, thank you, sir. All right, here's the money. $20,000 well, so long, mister. I hope you enjoy the lighter. Oh, uh, just a moment. I, I also admire that uh, necktie you are wearing. My necktie? <laughs> I know it sounds fantastic, but he bought my tie for $17,000. <laughs> and then he bought my shirt, my shoes, and my suit. And I gave him my last stitch of clothing, this mysterious stranger. Handed me $194,000 and two balloons. <laughs> Having no clothes, I blew up the balloons and danced my way home. <laughs> the next day, I met the little man for a second time. Again, he gave me fabulous prices for my clothes, and again, I danced my way home. On the third day, the same thing happened. I was not only getting richer, but I was dancing better. <laughs> Our daily meetings were more than a mere coincidence. A bond developed between us. Two weeks later, I was sitting in the kitchen having breakfast with my wife and my three lovely children, Anaheim, Azusa, and Cuca. <laughs> The little man had not yet come downstairs. Yes, he was living with us. Come on, children, finish your breakfast. That's right, children, eat every bit of it. But, Dowdy, I'm tired of this silly old caviar. <laughs> why can't we have oatmeal like we used to? Because we're rich, that's why. Now, hurry up or you'll be late for school. Where's Junior? Oh, he's out in the backyard making mud pies out of butter. <laughs> Heaven's sake, doesn't he know he's going to ruin his mink overalls? Anyway, he's been out there long enough. Junior, Junior, get ready for school. Oh, Daddy, I don't want to go to that new school. I bought it, and you'll go to it. <laughs> now, get ready. You know, darling, things just haven't been the same since that stranger came to live with us. He frightens me. There's something weird about him. You know, I've been feeling the safe. Quiet, here he comes now. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. Bad. <laughs> uh, sit down. Thank you. I, I'm sorry I'm late for breakfast, but I, I overslept. <laughs> I was out in a party last night. A party? Well, how do you feel this morning? <laughs> Well, have some tomatoes. <laughs> yes, I'll get you some. Well, you know I envy you two. Oh, a beautiful home and lovely children. Haven't you any children? No. I married a smudge pot. <laughs> oh, then you have no children? No. But we are lousy with oranges. <laughs> oh. Uh, by the way, I... I don't feel I should live here any longer without paying you rent. How much do you want? Well, I'm no crazy thing. 
Let's forget it. Oh, no, 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 I insist. Would uh, a million dollars a week be enough? <laughs> well, with or without meals? <laughs> oh, uh, with meals. That'll be three dollars extra. <laughs> I'll be glad to pay for it. Glad! Things like this were happening every day. Had gone money, had money, money, money. My, life, my wife left me. And so did my three lovely children. Atchison, Topeka, and Irving. <laughs> they ran off with a Harvey girl. I didn't care I had my money. I'd accumulated millions of dollars, which I kept in my shoes. I was now 11 feet six. <laughs> I begged the OPA to raise the ceiling. <laughs> One day, as I was sweeping some loose chains under the rug, he came in. Now cut that out! Hello, my friend. I have a present for you. A brand new $10,000 bill. $10,000 bill? Let me have it. Give it to me quick. I gotta have it. All right, all right. But be careful how you handle it. The ink is still wet. Don't worry. The ink is still wet. Wait a minute. You mean you've been printing this money yourself? Certainly doesn't everybody. <laughs> oh, so that's it. I must have been blind up to see through this whole scheme. My life is ruined. I lost my wife and my three lovely children. Sarah, Toga, and Trunk. <laughs> Tire, a shirt, or a suit. All I got is money, 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 and all counterfeit. You've even got my cigarette lighter, and I like a fool to win an extra flip. Yes, you are a fool. Do you think I'd really pay $17,000 for a necktie? $22,000 for your button shoes? Now, wait a minute. Yes, you are a fool. Do you think I'd give you $500 for a dinner when I could get the same thing at Ciro's for $400? <laughs> And those balloons you gave me weren't any good either. They broke on the sunset bus and embarrassed me. <laughs> and for all this time, you've been nothing but a counterfeit. Well, what's the difference? We can still do business. I can print the money and you can get rid of it. For never, me. never, never. I'll kill you first. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill you. Get your hands up. I Take them away. Don't kill me. I'll give you back your clothes. Oh, my clothes? What good are they now? You've had the pants short. <laughs> and the coat taken in. You even cut off the belts in the back. <laughs> Don't show me. Why must I always die at the end? <laughs> Shall we go? <laughs> yes. And so, as I walked through the little green door, I thought of my three lovely children. Fickle, finger, and face. <laughs> I stand condemned. Next Sunday, we'll be with you again broadcasting from the permanent Army Air Base at Marshfield. 
Well, Peter Lorry, I want to thank you very much for appearing on my program. It's a pleasure to be here, Jack. I may not see you later, so I want to pay you for your performance right now. Here oh. you are. Three thousand dollars. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Be careful how you handle it. The ink is still wet. <laughs> The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, this is the month of March. And as I mentioned before, we're broadcasting from March Field. So here we are at March Field in the month of March. Now, isn't that clever? Get it, fellas? <laughs> March Field, month of March. It took four writers to think of that. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Don. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, March is the month that comes in like a lion. Hmm. Uh, that's enough, Sergeant. Just sit down. <laughs> sit down, Don. Yes, folks, it comes in like a lion and goes out like a lamb. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lieutenant. <laughs> Lie down, Bob. <laughs> we can't bring you a lamb or a lion, but we can bring you an elk. And here he is, Jack Benny. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I don't happen to belong to the elks. Uh, this tooth I'm wearing on my watch chain is a souvenir of the First World War. An MP gave it to me. An MP gave it to you? Yes, one night I talked back to him and he just happened to bump his knuckle on my tooth as he pulled his fist out of my mouth. <laughs> he handed me my tonsils, too, but they didn't fit on my chain. Now, wait a minute, Jack. An MP can arrest you, but he has no right to jam his fist in your mouth. Don't worry, Don. I got even with him. What'd you do? I swallowed his flashlight. Oh. <laughs> For the next three months, every time I sat down, my eyes lit up. I was the only guy that could read in bed after nine o'clock. <laughs> but let's not talk about me after... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, bright eyes. Hiya, fellas. Well, Mary, Mary, how do you like it here? Mm, fine. I always enjoy visiting a naval base. Mary, March Field isn't a naval base. It is during the rainy season, brother. Oh, yes, yes. Hey, you know, fellas, we had that joke five years, but uh, during the war, they wouldn't let us discuss weather conditions. For five long years, nobody knew it rained in California. <laughs> That's right. Rain is back, and California's got it. You said it. Say, Jack, I meant to ask you, are you going to take me to the dance tonight at the officers' club? Wait a minute, Mary. What about the date you've got with Colonel Coons? You know, you told me that at 8 o'clock tonight he was going to take his jet-propelled plane and fly all the way to New York and back. Isn't that right? Yeah, but what am I going to do the rest of the evening? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Say, hey, those planes really go fast. Eh? Fast? Yesterday, when one of those jet planes was getting ready to fly east, the crew chief said, ready, the pilot said, okay, and between O and K, he landed in Chicago. <laughs> You know, fellas, we wrote that joke five years ago, but they didn't have jet planes then. <laughs> they got them now, though. About a month ago, one of those planes flew from Los Angeles to San Diego in 10 minutes and 17 seconds. Gosh, that's almost as fast as the Riverside bus. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly is. Huh? You know, Jack, I've been reading up on those new planes. They're going to have a lot of these jet-propelled P-80s in the AAF. AAF? Yes, the Army Air Forces. Oh. <laughs> What are you laughing at, Mary? Jack's a P-50 VPP. P-50 VPP? A uh, past 50 vitamin pill propelled. <laughs> we wrote that five years ago. I was only 32 at the time. Yes, sir. And it don't be so funny because you. Hiya, know. fellas. That Jackson is great, but here comes Harris like a P38. <laughs> well, 
Well, well, well, if it isn't our own little grassy acres over there. <laughs> Grassy acres. Yes, Phil, that's a spot here in camp that's just like you. It's green, pretty, and useless. <laughs> well, I'm not so green. I know what's going on. I'm half. I ain't no paddlefoot. Paddlefoot? What's that? Well, that's an officer that commands an LSD. LSD? Large steel desk. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. They... Yeah, the, uh, the top of the desk is a landing strip for their feet. Yeah, I know yeah. Say, Jackson, you're pretty sharp today. You would be, too, if you'd get here for rehearsal. What are you talking about? Mary and I stopped in Riverside, and we saw you coming out of the Chi-Chi bar. <laughs> what did you say the name of that place was? Chi-Chi. Oh, bless you. I thought I was seeing double. <laughs> well, for you, that isn't hard, you know? Anyway, Phil, we'll forget about that. Now, here we are at Marchfield, so let's show the boys we're glad we came down. Well, you're right, Jackson. There's something about this place that really gets into you, especially when the wind blows. What? It gets in your shoes, gets in your hair, gets in your ears. I know, I know. Well, I wrote that joke five years ago. And, and it still fits. fits. I know, yeah. <laughs> Maybe so, Phil, but in spite of that, Marchfield is a great place, and the boys are very happy here. That's because there are so many things to do. You're right, Jack. There are a lot of things for the boys to do, but there's only one trouble. What's that, Mary? If you like it, it's out of bounds. <laughs> well, I have to have rules, Mary. After all, there's some important training going on here. Important training? Certainly, Phil. Haven't you seen the fellows here take these jet planes up and zoom and dive and roll and spin? That goes on for three months. What happens after that, Jackson? They get a license to drive a car in California. <laughs> hey, I'm really hot today. You see, Phil, if you'd come to rehearsal, you'd... Hmm, that's funny. Well, what's the matter, Jack? Look, uh, that soldier sitting there in the front row. He hasn't laughed once through the entire show. Maybe he's a spy for Fred Allen. <laughs> no, he hasn't got him in uniform yet. I'm going to find out what's bothering that fellow. Hey, soldier. Hey, private. You there in the front row. Me? Yes, yes, you. Come up here on the stage a minute. Phil, give him a hand, will you? Okay. Uh, That's it. Now, step right over here. Yes, sir. Uh, look, soldier, I've been watching you all through the show, and you haven't as much as smiled once. I'm curious to know why you're so sad. Well, well... Yes? Why shouldn't I be sad? Today... Today... Yes? Today they're going to give me my discharge. <laughs> What? Today they're taking away my uniform and sending me home. No, no, I know how you feel, but try and cheer up. Well, that's right, soldier. It isn't so bad going home. Lots of soldiers like it. They force themselves. Well, I'll bet you'll forget all about Marchfield in a few days. What? Me forget about the wonderful times I've had here? All the fun I've had living in those beautiful barracks? <laughs> Forget about the wonderful weather which kept me so nice and cool in the winter that I didn't thaw out till the sun fried me in August. <laughs> so you expect me to forget about the lovely dust storms I've enjoyed here? Soldier. No other dust in the country is as healthy as this dust. Now, Private. You I... expect me to forget about our cute little mess hall with eight or nine hundred friends blowing in my soup? <laughs> Soldier, please. You expect me to forget all those guys who were so sweet to me? My buddies, the lieutenants, the captains, the majors? Soldier, soldier, take it easy. You got this thing all wrong. They don't just turn you out like that. They give you a button. You'll be proud of us. A beautiful bronze button. But you can't buy any clothes. Where am I going to wear it? <laughs> Now, soldier, soldier, don't you worry about clothes. Things aren't as bad as you think they are. You, know, you see me after the show, and we'll have a little talk. Oh, Jack, you're not going to sell him your suit. Mary, he can have his choice. I brought five of them with me. I'll talk to you after the program, soldier. Now, sit down and cheer up. All right, Phil, let's have a band number, and then we'll... I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester, where are you? You should have been here an hour ago. It isn't my fault, boss. I went off the road and got lost. Well, where are you now? The farmhouse. Well, ask the farmer how to get to Marge Field. The farmer isn't here. Well, who is there? The farmer's daughter, a soldier, and an MP. <laughs> MP, military police? 
No, a minister from Pomona. <laughs> oh, well, offer them my congratulations and come on out here. Okay. Now, remember, when you get to Riverside, you go through town, then turn right, and March Field is just eight miles ahead. Now, leave the farmhouse right away and get out here. But, boss, I can't leave till after the wedding. Till after the wedding? Why not? They're giving me a pound of butter to sing, Oh, Promise Me. <laughs> oh, well, give them two fast choruses and get out here. I'm waiting for you. Okay. What's the matter, Jack? Something always... <clears throat> that was Personality, played by Phil Harris, and it makes you want to be transferred to Muroc Orchestra. <laughs> What a band. And now, folks... There he goes again. There he goes picking on the band. Libby, tell Jackson to lay off. Phil's right, Jack. His boys may not be great musicians, but at least they're gentlemen. Mary, just because they tip their hats when they pass a pool room doesn't mean they're gentlemen. <laughs> now, let's forget it. Well, I'm not forgetting it, Jackson. My boys don't like that stuff. They're sensitive. The things you said about them at rehearsal made them cry. <laughs> made them cry? Yeah, they may look like that they're tough and they ain't got no feelings, but... They'll cry at the drop of a bottle. <laughs> Only if it breaks, believe me. And the least you can do is tell Frankie, your guitar player, to do something about his appearance. That hair of his. The way it stands up, he looks like he was pardoned after they threw the switch. <laughs> Pardon me for interrupting your program, Mr. Benny, but there's a soldier here who's being discharged, and it's time for him to go home. Oh, yes, yes, Colonel. I, I was talking to him before. There he is in the front row. Oh, yes. Come on, son. It's time to go home. <laughs> no, no, not yet. I, I don't want to go yet. Please don't make me go. <laughs> but, son, the limousine is waiting, and the chauffeur will drive you all the way home. <laughs> I'll go now. I'll go. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Colonel. Well, thank you, Mr. Benny. Now, uh, just go right ahead with your program. Oh, hello, Dennis. I didn't see you come in. Uh, what, uh, what was that you said before, Dennis? I said my mother thinks the only good parts on the show are the commercials and my singing. Oh, oh, she, uh, she does, huh? Yeah. She thinks you're the worst comedian on the air. <laughs> Oh, she she does, huh? Yeah. She thinks you're awful. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. When you say hello again, she gets sick to her stomach. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I've always had trouble with your mother. When you first came to work with, for me, she came down to the studio and tried to make a big fuss. But she didn't scare me. Well, you better stay away from her now, Mr. Benny. Why? She took boxing lessons from Ingrid Bergman. <laughs> All I know is your mother never did like me. Mary's mother hates me, too. Oh, Jack, my mother does not hate you. She does, too. She does not. Then why, Mary? Tell me, why does she go around telling everybody that I'm the cheapest guy in the world? Because you are. Oh. <laughs> well, she's lucky I am, or I'd sue her for everything she's got. <laughs> Believe me. Anyway, Mr. Benny, whether my mother likes you or not, I'm glad I'm back with you since I got out of the Navy. Well, thank you. And I like the suit you sold me, too. It's all right, kid. But gee, Mr. Benny, I never saw pants before with the pleats in the back. Let's see. Dennis, you got the pants on backwards. Oh, I guess I was in the Navy too long. <laughs> That's probably it. Now, Dennis, uh, Dennis, as I was telling you before, when you do your song, I'm going to... Oh, for heaven's sake, nothing but interruptions. I'll take it. Hello? Hello, boss, it's me. Oh, my goodness. Where are you now? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, don't tell me you're lost again. Lost? I found roads that even Hope and Crosby don't know about. <laughs> what? I passed Utopia twice. Roger, have you any idea where you are now? Wait till I look at the sign. What does it say? From the cradle to the grave, always use Burma shave. <laughs> I don't mean that. Now, Rochester, listen carefully. Come back to Riverside. 
Then go through the town, turn to the right, and you can't miss Mark's Field. Who can? <laughs> you can. Rock says, look, just ask somebody. Ask anybody how to get there. Wait a minute, boss. A soldier just came in to use the phone. I'll ask him. Okay. Uh, say, soldier, how do you get to March Field? March Field, March Field, they're taking me away from here. I want to go back. I want to go back. Please, please, please. What's going on there? It's no use, boss. I'll have to find it myself. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. And now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Day will sing a song written by Frank Lesser and dedicated to the memory of one of America's greatest war heroes, Roger Young. Thank all the officers and men stationed here at March Field for inviting us down here today at a swell time. And say, Mary. What, Jack? You know who's going to be our guest star next week? The MGM star, Van.